Why not? Okay, so I, I, I let me do the intro again. So Good. welcome everyone to our December first Fridays. Um, this is part two of our Overland um, base bar experiment, and I'm going to turn it over to Joseph to um, introduce uh, this month's program. Hi, everyone. So very brief, very, very brief recap. The um, experiment we did last summer, um, we had 11 um, makers adjusting 11 violins. And what in studying two things, base bar scoop, um, each violin went through five steps pictured here. And we did measurements of radiation and admittance um, after each one. And, and then, um, excuse me, um, this is actually base bar, it's a scoop. Huh. I think I've got the wrong picture in there. Um, at any rate, um, for base bar height, um, if I looked at the averages for over across four violins for all steps, and um, the one stage two provided higher output on average in each of four frequency bands than any other. So it kind of confirmed that the more or less normal height of, I would think it's 11.8 going down to 3.8, um, um, excuse me, um, 14 going down to 11.9 with 4.5 going down to 3.8 at the ends gave the highest output. You started to lose when you went below that. Um, now, of course, anyone um, out there who knows anything about <laughs> measuring and statistics would be squirming at that because um, that's an average. So I've just quickly looked at the individual instruments to see which one of those followed that um, um, finding. In other words, was that true for all the violins? And it turned out that it was pretty good. It was true for three of the four violins. Um, and for the fourth violin, you could say it's arguably true and this was interesting, although the overall level in band four went down, it actually increased the peak height quite a bit. So it moved the, the energy down a bit. And that happens to be at 3.8 kilohertz, which is nominally the ear's most um, sensitive point. So uh, my conclusion for now is that that's um, reasonably robust um, within the, the smallness of the samples, et cetera. Now, when we looked at um, scoop, um, it's it's it was less firm conclusion. Um, on average, stage four gave the highest output in all frequencies. That's the red line on top, um, and that was really the lowest before we 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 took off the ends. Um, but it's it's not nearly as um, well separated as in the other one. Let me. Um, um, so what I did is I looked at the individual ones again and saw, and to see which ones this was true for. And it turned out that um, by that same measure, highest in all bands, um, stage two worked for one of them, stage th three worked for um, two of them. And somewhere between stage four and five, believe it or not, worked for two of them. It's hard to say because it might be a little you know, a little less in one band, a little less in the other. Um, all of which to say the average, which was in here at stage four should be taken as just that. Um, um, but it does, it is interesting. It definitely good to add some scoop um, to the base bar to increase power. Um, and this spread suggests to me more than the base bar height experiment did. There's some interesting work to be done on why these instruments did better with different amounts of scoops. Um, in terms of how did their archings differ, for example, and um, um, some other things. So um, that's all I have to say about it. There's a lot more interesting things going on, and those will be hopefully reported down the line. Oh, good. So let me um, turn it over to George, or do we want to answer any questions on that, or let's just move straight ahead? Anybody there? If you have any questions, um, you can use the raise hand function. Well, I guess not. Oh, what? Oh, Chris. Chris. 
So I'm, I'm interested on the uh, variation across position. Uh, did you look at all at that as to how uniform those differences were, regardless of the angle of the microphone? Um, I, I didn't, honestly. Um, you, you mentioned having a student who might be interested in looking at this sort of stuff. Um, that would be great. Um, in fact, we should we should be in touch about that because uh, there's actually a, a various ideas about different ways of looking at it, and that's that that's certainly one. All right, George. If I can share the screen, is that my yep. host? Go ahead. Um, blah blah blah. That one. Uh, that doesn't seem to have worked. Uh, we can see your presentation. Yeah, but can you just you see it in design mode, not in presentation mode? Right, we see the um, the side panels too. Yeah. Uh, what am I doing wrong? Just go the slideshow on the top line. Oh, that? Oh, okay. Perfect. We see the slideshow. Okay. So, uh, good. Oh, well, it's. Good lunch December for first now. And good evening for the rest of us. And some people, good morning. Uh, I hope you don't find this disruptive, but I, I feel the, the need to kind of put this base bar a little bit more in context, because the base bar isn't an isolated component. It's optimum dimensions, position, profile, all of those things depend somewhat on the rest of the instrument, like on the uh, where uh, the sound post and ha and the stiffness of the back. So uh, I've put together some things just to kind of, um, uh, you know, add, add some ideas to this. So this goes back to uh, 2008, these handmade animations of a slice through the middle of a violin. And we'll do it slightly differently. It just happens that the uh, violin I was looking at at that time for the B1 both the B1 minus and the B1 plus seem to have a, um, a, corp a CBR component. And, and there's more move for the B1 minus, there was more movement in the C bout on the um, uh, G side than on the E side and the other way around for B1 plus. And it's not like that for a lot of instruments, particularly Del Jesus, they tend to have rather more equal corpus bending components on both sides. But the point of this drawing is um, simply that uh, at the low frequencies, a lot of the time, this island area, which is separated by the effholes, uh, can rock quite freely around the, the sound post. Uh, but this is not true for all frequencies. This is a sort of default starting position, which allows the violin to couple in the rocking motion that's excited by a more or less transverse uh, bowing direction uh, along the top of the bridge to allow that to couple into volume changing modes, which were originally symmetric breathing modes, but made asymmetric by the addition of the sound post. Um, now this idea of rotational ad admittance, this is something that Jim Woodhouse introduced me to, and it's in one of his papers, I'm not sure if it's on the Bridge Hill or one of them, but anyway, it's uh, there's some details about it, how to how to do the calculation, and all of this can be done uh, from my FRF overlay uh, application. If you measure a two by two matrix at the uh, bridge feet position, so without a sound post, you can see the all right. So uh, there's a bit more um, uh, motion in the rotational component than the vertical. So the uh, vertical component has to be measured um, using the difference between the movement of the two feet uh, plus the spacing of the feet. But I so say this can you can read this up in his, his article. But if I put in the sound post, things look a little bit different. Like there's uh, um, a lot more rotational activity in the lower frequencies, uh, pivoting around the. Uh, a lot of it pivoting around the sound post. Um, well, then actually, it actually stays all the way through, doesn't it? There's a lot more 
uh, apart from somewhere around here. That was probably B1 plus. There's uh, the um, definitely the rotational component is greater. So uh, then um, this was around 2018. I worked with uh, Colin actually on this project to try and um, look at some historic instruments and uh, how the evolution um, of the of the violin from uh, instruments that behaved in a different way. So this example I found is ra uh, rather curious uh, little viola da mano, which is like a, a sort of a bit like a baroque guitar, but it has these amazingly deep cutouts. Um, very shallow. It's a shallow box. It's very very lightly built. And then in contrast, this uh, clunky um, uh, viola di braccio, which is, has a, uh, the body and the neck and everything is carved out of a solid bit. Ugh. Is that somebody yawning there? Did I hear? <laughs> uh, so, um, and it's quite thick, like, you know, the top is about four millimeters thick. But the uh, thing that's really different is it has these long F-hole slots. So uh, you don't have to read all of this nonsense. But you, you can if you're really quick. So if we're looking at the um, viola rotational admittance in green and the viola de braccio in uh, no, red is the viola, green is the viola de braccio. So you can see the viola has uh, been very thin and flexible right at the bottom end. It's got quite a lot of activity, but the um, viola de braccio, in spite of being sort of he much heavier built, takes over at the top end. So this is, uh, I think this is quite important. I found actually the bridge doesn't have to actually be right in the island area for this to take effect. Even if it's at the ends, you still get the same effect. Um, so, uh, in terms of behaviour of um, some of these uh, particular family of instruments, I refer to the set of Ganassi vials that some Swiss people have done reconstructions on. They're likewise the same, like this, uh, being able to put in these, excite these uh, anti-symmetric modes isn't the greatest for the low frequency output, but it's very good for an extended high frequency. So if you've got nice quality strings, you'll get a lot of ringing in the high end of these instruments, but not a, a lot of weighty bass that you get on a later type of vial with bass bar and sound post. And when we look at some of the modes, these are once computed modes against the measured ones. So we see on the, on the bottom, do you see my mouse or should I use a pointer? Pointer options. Yeah, there's my laser pointer. You can see a very clear breathing mode there. That's volume, net volume change. Uh, here you've got what I call an anti-breathing. Both plates have the same shape, but they move in the same direction. Then we move to the uh, longitudinal dipole. These are uh, the kind of things you see on a, a violin without a corpus. And there again, now we've got a, um, a couple of modes there, but this, this one corresponds very well to Colin's computation. Uh, there's something funny about those numbers. I think the decimal points uh, slipped. Uh, so um, this mode we see very much on a, a violin corpus without a mode at about 600 hertz. And that's this peculiar mixture of, uh, well, never mind the details, but I said they're very like violin modes without a sound post. But here, we don't really have a, a simple net volume change mode. We have mixtures of um, sort of longitudinal dipoles and other things. We start to introduce corpus bending components, and that is, uh, we see them in this instrument, not the viola de braccio because the viola de braccio is pretty much rectangular and it doesn't have the benefit of these uh, foldable ribs that uh, so that the thin uh, sort of thin height of the sh or shallow box effect 
uh, brings down the corpus bending modes into the same frequency range that we have for the plate flexible modes, and that is important. Likewise, now we start to see sort of twist and various other things that, uh, and again, another very strong and anti-breathing type mode. But that will still, if there's some asymmetry in the top and the back, there will still be a net volume change. Uh, and then, then we have one that looks very like a CVR, but it's rather high up. And that is, I believe that's because the um, plates are not arched. The arched plates accommodate this type of motion a lot more easily because they can change width without a lot of force. And I looked at a, uh, another time I looked at a, a factory made violin corpus and just to look at the, uh, what happened with sound posts. Uh, I was talking to Jim and the, the question was really, did sound posts change length very much in any of the frequency ranges of interest? So if I looked at this one, uh, so that corpus, I glued these little shoes on the outside of the plate so that I could tap in a vertical direction, actually aligned with the sound post. We find actually that really there's uh, the two ends are not moving independently, except just for up in this region, there's something a little bit going on there. I don't know quite what it is. And if I look on the alternative, if I look at really an imaginary parts instead of magnitude and phase, you can see there's, there is something going on there. But it's over a pretty narrow frequency range. But, uh, but by and large, both ends of the sound posts are moving together. So that means that the uh, impedance or dynamic stiffness presented by the sound post is dependent on the stiffness of the top plate itself at that point and the point on the back that it attaches to. So if, for example, you've got a very thin back made out of, uh, with low arching made out of slab cut wood, the mobility on the sound post side is going to be much greater. And therefore the kind of base bar that you need to balance that effectively is going to be different. Um, then again, we can uh, simply take an admittance measurement very close to the bridge foot on a violin. And we see at the low end, as we already know, in the signature mode region, we're talking about a lot of uh, hinging around the base bar, around the circle. There's, um, yeah, hinging around the sound post, but then as we go up into higher frequencies, actually we sometimes see a lot more activity on the uh, E side foot. So that is, we're saying that the base bar is starting to act perhaps like a reactive mass rather than a spring. Uh, I've kind of zoomed in a little bit and put some labels on. You don't need to spend a lot of time looking at that. Um, and the other big function of, of the base bar is it when it, it puts stiffness back. So if I, um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen these charts before where I, I plot the um, plate impedance using Evans Z numbers uh, as I as I graduate the plate. So starting up, you know, 70 grams and ending up, this one ending up around 55. Uh, then I put the base bar back. I've actually got increased the Z value back to uh, an, a number that was uh, that I had when the top was a lot thicker. But I've got the same uh, frequency, well, similar frequencies and Z values uh, for less mass. So if I take those over, so uh, uh, well, in the finished one, if I follow that line across there, although my uh, top is only 50, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, compared to when it was 55, by putting the base bar back, I've, uh, I've got the values rather more like when it was about 62. And this asymmetry of the base bar on its own is 
perhaps a, a lot less important than we've perhaps imagined. You, you might think that it creates uh, a strong asymmetry, but it's, it's actually not so much. So when we look at the, uh, the a violin without a sound post, we can still have very clearly separated symmetric and anti-symmetric modes. But at the same time, in historic instruments, sometimes there's deliberate asymmetry built into the into the tops, like say with the thicker side or something like that. And in some cases, a bass bar right down the middle. But it seems that uh, somebody observed that this asymmetry could uh, could couple symmetric and anti-symmetric modes, meaning that when you uh, a bow in the horizontal uh, uh, direction, uh, you excite volume change modes as well. And then, uh, but then the addition of the sound post is a much more effective uh, strategy for doing that with the bass bar. Um, I think we're near the end now. So uh, Unai and, uh, and uh, he did it first, I think, with Roberto, and then they lost the data. And Unai did this experiment again with uh, at the um, violin making school in Bilbao. So he's only got uh, three steps. He's got an oversized bar, a normal one. I don't know why it says blues, but it does. Cross that out. And, the, uh, and what we do see from here is uh, the, at least these um, three modes. They come. They come down in frequency as you reduce the size of the bass bar. Not so much uh, B1 minus, but B1 plus quite a lot. Uh, that would be A1 in there. And CBR, they're not actually in that order for some reason. So I think the normal bar is, is higher. Um, is that right? No, that's right. It's come down in amplitude, but it's, it has... Uh, it's in the right uh, expected frequency place. So that's the that's it. Anybody like to see another slide or ask a question before I shut it down? Um, a quick question, George. Oh yes, of course. Um, the rotational admittance—that's just a horizontal admittance, but taken at a slightly off angle. No. No, it isn't. It's uh, it's you have to measure a matrix of uh, two ah. two admittance measurements and two transfer functions. Then there's a little little calculation, which in, has to include the foot spacing and the height to the top of the bridge. So uh, you've heard of things like a torque wrench, haven't you? When you take your engine, you take your cylinder head gasket off. You have a big long lever that you use to kind of rotate the nut and it measures the, um, the the torsional force that you're applying to it. So we're looking at the the bridge as a model. If you imagine a little like a little clock spring with a lever, it's to do with how it its resistance to rotation, not simply to the vertical like that. But okay, so it's it's calculated, in other words, from in phase and out of phase motion. Yes. Okay. So you have to take these four measurements, and it's a it's reason I don't do it more often is it's actually it's rather tricky to do because um, you can never make the two transfer functions identical. You're using an accelerometer because you've got to move it from one side to the other, so they're not exactly balanced in mass. Do you want me uh, to say a word about this? Yes, excellent idea. Yeah, I mean, Jim. just 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 briefly, it, it's it, it, it's the input for the bridge hill calculation. So it's a measurement you can make on a corpus with no bridge and strings, but at the positions where the bridge feet are going to be. So you put an accelerometer and tap on both feet. You move the accelerometer to the other one and tap on both feet. So four standard measurements, and then a, a little bit of magic in the computer. And it gives you the thing which is the is the rotational motion, which is the kind of input to the bridge model for the bridge bending and the bridge hill calculation. Okay, that helps. Yeah. So it's the this fact that the a lot of the input is rotational 
it uh, shows you actually that still in in the violin in the modern violin a lot of the excitation is to do with left right uh, anti-symmetric modes it's still there but because of this these two deliberately introduced asymmetries we have a better coupling into volume change modes and a rather different spectrum than we would get with a so you get a rather more level spectrum with a you know with um without the sound post uh you know with the high frequencies you wouldn't have that big roll off at about four kilohertz in the same way i don't think anyway there's still work to be done on that but um i put it in there because i think this is how we need to think of the two feet having different uh, input impedances at those two positions so uh, so impedance if we think of that as a frequency dependent stiffness the the two behavior of the two feet are not the same at all frequencies they behave according to the mode shapes and all kinds of other factors there's a, another question Sibella. Um, George, I did not understand what you were doing with the shoes on the outside. Oh, that's purely because the um, arch plates have a slope. So, a, um, you know, if I laid a straight edge uh, on the end of the sound post at the on the top and the back, they're not parallel. Oh, okay. be sort of, uh, if you can see my hands, it'd be sort of sloping like that. So by putting these shoes on, little tiny pieces there, it means that I can excite it so that the direction of force is the same at both ends. Yeah, thank you. And it makes a little bit of difference to the measurement. Any other questions? If not, I can I can stop the share and we can move on to Colin. Yes? No? Anybody? Anybody tell me what to do? Stop the share. Right. I'm putting on share screen. Any sign? Not nope. yet. Not yet. Can you see my first screen? Nope, not yet. What before? Let me hit it again, share screen. Screen two. All right, something's starting to happen. It took a while last time. I think yes, and then, yeah, we also see the uh, transcription, real time transcription as well. Well, I'm sorry about that. There's no <laughs> way we can do that. But that, that, that. That's Google or Zoom getting in the way of my computer. Are you happy for me to start then? Yes, go ahead. Okay, well, w w welcome everyone. I, it's great to see you all. Um, um, I, I'm going to talk about the measurements that we made um, on all the instruments um, using the internal mic as a way of measuring the acoustic properties. Um, uh, in the actual measurements, I was very ably assisted by Guy and Amarin, um, who prepared the instruments before I actually made the instrument, made the measurements. For example, the measurements, as we'll see in, in just a second, were made with the, the strings damped. Um, and so that had to be done before I could take over and to, to do the measurements. I need to find out how to do the next slide. Um, just a moment. Um, this will stop another screen here. Do you want to continue? The answer is yes. Right. OK. Um, why is the transcription of the text appearing below your screen? 
well, it's not transcription of, of the text. It, it's something that is actually um, making a transcription of what I'm actually saying, and it's appearing on the screen. And I have no idea how to get rid of it. Fan and I tried um, uh, beforehand, and we, unless someone has a clever idea, that that's going to be there all the time. But just just don't take any notice of that, and just concentrate on the actual screen itself if that's acceptable. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, now the outline of my talk is um, briefly to um, describe the internal cavity sound measurements, because not everyone here will be familiar with making measure measurements. These are different; they're complementary type of measurements to um, the admittance and radiation measurements. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, I'll just describe them for those that are not um, familiar, uh, uh, relatively briefly. Um, <clears throat> then I'll the summarize summer, summer. Sorry, what was that? No, somebody was unmuted. It's fine. Now. Okay, fine. Okay. I'm going to summarize the measurements on all instruments with the five modified base height, bar heights, and profile changes. And um, there's a number of interesting outcomes of the measurements, which are rather different from those that uh, <coughs> um, uh, have been concentrated on the moment. And um, I'll talk to some, if there is time, um, some other sorts of measurements that, that are related and give us a little bit of information, in fact, on um, the measurements that we've made. The great thing about measuring so many instruments, you can look for um, overall features that appear in them all. And um, the same thing with the base bar, as um, Joseph has, has been describing. So ju just, a, just a picture for the moment. Um, the measurement is a very simple one. One has a hammer that strikes the top of the bridge. Um, and a microphone inserted into the center, somewhere we could call the acoustic center of the bridge, which I've described in a moment, um, which is just in front of the bridge. Um, it can be at any height because the modes are essentially two-dimensional um, with very little variation along the height um, because it's a shallow um, box. I choose to um, damp my strings um, uh, on the end of the fingerboard, which I find to be very um, effective. It doesn't actually change the modes of the violin uh, as we measure them. Um, <clears throat> and the, the violin is mounted on soft foam, so it's in the free sort of state. There's no nothing holding um, the, the instrument other than soft pads, one on the underneath the neck and um, two on either side. Just let me say, we can actually measure the sound from the instrument from a gentle tap. Um, that, that, that tap causes the plates to vibrate. And the vibrating plates, of course, are radiate sound, but they also radiate sound into the cavity of the violin. And the cavity acts as a sort of micro recording studio, travels around with the violin, and it's basically the, the same size for all violins. And it allows you, in fact, to make high quality measurements on all instruments of the violin family, and in principle, any hollow body string instrument, um, guitars, banjos, lutes, and all the rest. Um, the important thing I want to emphasize is that any measurements that one makes on a violin or any other instrument, you measure what are called the normal modes of the instrument. Those are the things that we call A0, CBR, B1 minus, B1 plus, etc. And all those normal modes involve the coupled vibrations of all its component parts. That's exactly what George was saying in, in his talk. And very importantly, this includes the air inside the cavity. And that affects just as much the measurements we're going to be described now as in, uh, in radiation and admittance measurements. The, uh, the, the whole purpose of, of developing this uh, way of measuring is that it, it's very inexpensive. Um, it's very quick and easy to use. Um, and thanks to Chris Rogers and George Stepani, we have software 
um, but is generally freely available so we can analyze the results very easily. And therefore it's ideal in principle for the uh, <clears throat> maker's workshop to do very quick and easy measurements on the characteristics of a violin while it's actually being made and while it's being set up when an instrument comes back uh, for restoration, whatever it might be. And one of the important features is, is that it, um, um, it is, produces high quality measurements that are essentially free from the room acoustics. So we don't get complications. Just a little bit about the details of what goes together to make the measurements. Um, I use a, a very simple um, hammer um, that can be either in a pendulum mount on, on the left hand side here. There's a ha ha hammer sensor here, a sensor which I'll talk about in just in a moment. Uh, or I can actually glue it onto a, a, a beam like this. And this is a flexible beam, so you can twang it, as it were, to hit it. But both give, give identical results. Um, it's just what's easiest to use. Um, the whole experiment is based on the use of what are called electric microphones. Um, they're, they're little things like this. They come in various sizes, five millimeters, up to about um, um, uh, those smaller ones, three, three and four millimeter ones, up, up to about 10 millimeters, one centimeter. They're two terminal devices, very simply. Um, they only got two terminals uh, because they have an, a diaphragm inside um, that's pre-polarized. So you don't need the extra high voltage to polarize. It's essentially a condenser microphone that's already repolarized. One of them I use to measure the sound inside. I generally use a five millimeter uh, <coughs> a diameter microphone inside because you can generally get that through the easily thread it through the um, F holes. Um, and I use a, just by historic reasons, I use a, a, um, a 10 centimeter one, no, not 10 centimeter, 10 millimeter, um, as the hammer. And what I do is to cover the end of the, the active end of the microphone that's opposite to the terminals um, with um, some uh, an epoxy cap. Basically, um, it covers the sensitive part and the hole that takes the, air, the sound into the in, inside to excite the diaphragm. Um, and it replaces it uh, so that no sound gets in, in principle. And now it acts as an accelerometer, because now if, if, if you move that rapidly, it leaves the diaphragm behind and gives you a signal, just like the pressure of the sound wave would have done. And therefore, uh, it, it, it measures the acceleration of this device with some very electronics, which I'll just briefly show in a minute. And um, the force that's acting on the bridge as it impacts and bounces off the bridge in typically a, a, a few hundred microseconds, very fast, um, it's very high acceleration rates um, as, it, uh, as it bounces on and off the bridge. Uh, and um, it's, uh, it, um, that, that provides the force. And from that, you can work out the energy that's actually input into the um, taking the time derivative of, of, of that force, you can t t take out, work out the energy distributed. Uh, it's a very short pass over all the frequencies that one's going to be interested in. Um, so, whoops, I apologize. I've got this wretched thing at the bottom here. Oh, I can get it out of the way, right. Let's put it over there. Right. Um, um, so, sorry, I'm having some trouble operating the system. Um, um, it, 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 what, what that shock tap does is, is to excite all what are called the normal modes. Um, uh, that have got a component of vi their vibration that's acting in the same direction as the hammer is hitting it. 
And fr from, from this, you can work out the energy that actually every impulse that you make when you tap a violin um, it, it, it goes into the system, excites all the normal modes, it, sh it shock excites them all, and, um, and, and then use some computer electronics to um, work out what the equivalent frequency spectrum is now at each of the individual frequencies. The, the electronics involved is very, very simple. It, the, the device requires a biasing voltage because inside it's got an amplifier so that um, it amplifies the, what's happening to the, damp, the diaphragm and it puts out it out at what's called a line voltage. Right? This is very different from a piezoelectric type of device, which can be fed directly then into um, an amplifier which is recording the sound to go into the computer. We won't go into those details, but it's very simple electronics that are involved. Um, and what they're going to excite are the cavity air modes. And this is some computations uh, that I did, in fact, on um, the inside of essentially the Titian Strad, um, as though it had rigid walls. So this is what would happen to the just the air inside um, vibrating. And the air inside, of course, can get out through the F holes. So the lowest frequency is at around about 290 hertz. These are computed frequencies. There's something called an A1 mode. And this is just, a. I, I use little A's and, um, when I'm talking about the component vibrations. And I talk uh, of large A's when I'm talking about what you actually observe are the normal modes that are combined that in a moment I describe uh, is, is a mixture of these modes and the plate modes. Um, then, then there's a mode that are, um, that is about 500 Hertz. Um, then there's a mode in the lower bouts, which is at about 1,100 Hertz. The next mode that's really rather important for um, the measurements, because we make the measurements what's called, called the acoustic center. The acoustic center is where there's a node, in fact, of the A1 mode. It's very easily um, uh, uh, measured when one's doing measurements because it, um, you can get rid of any signal from it when you've got it exactly in that place. And that's the place that we choose. And it's just in front of the, the bridge, a, a few millimeters in front of the bridge on, on the, the center, center of the instrument along the longitudinal axis that's that axis there so you don't pick up this mode at all um because you just pick up what are called the symmetric modes the ones that are the same on the left and right and the asymmetric mode is one like this where it has opposite phases these colors represent um the displacements uh, or the, the pressures rather and the the, the pressures are uh, are opposite in phase in this mode here, um, here the blue is one phase, the red is, uh, is the opposite phase, and of course they alternate. This is a vibrating system, so the col colors would change if we could show you that. Um, but the next mode that one will measure is another mode here at A3, uh, about 1.2 kilohertz, and then there's some more modes at 1.5 and 1.8 and another one at 2.1. So there's very, very few air modes that are actually involved. And if we plot, in fact, the um, pressure along the axis, and these are computed uh, along the axis, you can see um, there's the A0 mode, which is not, um, the simple models would suggest that the pressure inside is always of a const constant amplitude, but because the violin is um, comparable in size with the, with, with the, the um, amplitude of the wave, sound waves, it picks up, um, um, air is flowing from the top, this is the top of the violin, the uh, top bout, and this is flowing down towards the uh, F holes, which are down in this region here, and same from the lower bout, and because you've got a flow of air, you've got um, a, a, a pressure difference along here, which is why it's not constant. Then there's other modes, which is um, the, a, the, this is this A1 mode, which is a positive of one end, goes to zero at that point there, 
And um, that's the nut end. And at this point here, it goes to zero again at the top of the instrument. And um, you can see there's, there's yet another mode, this, this mode here, which actually ha has a, um, um, a, a high, but it goes through a, 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 um, a, 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 has another minimum here, and it comes back again. It's like fitting sine waves in or cosine waves in between the um, ends of, uh, of the instrument. It's always highest, uh, the pressures are always high, highest around the edges. And if you consider these and these, you can see that here. And, um, and just like um, if you take the derivatives of these, the derivatives of these are just rather like sine waves because uh, they have zeros at either end. And these are the modes, in fact, that, that drive these modes here. These two modes are directly related. They're what, what the physicist calls complete orthonormal uh, orthogonal modes and normal modes. And you can describe the variations just like Fourier um, transforms that some people are, it will be familiar with. If you if you take any repetitive waveform with zeros at uh, uh, um, either end, you can fit sine waves into it um, of different wavelengths. Um, and um, if it's an open tube, like um, uh, uh, um, uh, just a hollow pipe where, where the ends are open, you fit in cosine waves. And you can do that exactly in the same way with the sine, the, the, the modes of the cavity air modes. You can use those, in fact, to describe um, the derivatives of, of those will um, give you, in fact, the, the modes that are actually driving them um, of the plates. Now, I talk about normal modes, which will be unfamiliar to most people uh, here. They're, they're something that, that even undergraduates um, in, in reading physics sometimes find a bit difficult, but they're really rather amazing. Because what you've actually got in, in the violin is you've got these cavity air modes. They're being excited by um, the, um, um, uh, the vibrational modes of the plates. And the vibrational modes of the plates can vary from plate to plate. Uh, the, top, the top plate and bottom plate don't necessarily have the same vibrational um, frequencies or waveforms. Um, you've got the bridge and the bridge hill area, which I shall emphasize, is a very, very important part of the violin and all instruments of the violin family. You've got the bass bar, and you've got the sound post, and all these things, if you were taking them by, the, by, the, by themselves, would actually have specific frequencies that they would vibrate at, and they'd all be different. They'd all have a particular waveform associated with it, like the ones that just they're just schematic, just to show what the sorts of things happen. Um, but the amazing thing is that these are all going to be coupled together. Um, the air inside um, acts as a compressible um, fluid and uh, not just simply uh, for the A0 mode, all the modes of the violin are in fact coupled to uh, the, the, the what I call here the shell modes of the violin. This is a shallow shell violin or cello, double bass, um, and um, they're, they're all coupled to all the cavity air modes. So what one, uh, and, and with each other. And the amazing thing is that uh, it, when you take all that coupling into account, what one comes up with is a set of what are called normal modes. And these are the things we measure in all measurements. They're the A0, CBR, B1 minus, B1 plus. And each one of these modes involves not only the shell or the, 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 the cavity walls um, um, and the air inside, the neck and everything else that I haven't put on here, the tailpiece resonances, and of course the strings, which are all important because the strings are all part of the, uh, the, the, these, um, these modes that we get here. And what we're really interested in is how much energy gets from the vibrating strings into the plates that, that vibrate and radiate sound. So they're very important 
And the important thing about normal modes is that it forces every normal mode includes there all the coupled motion, all vibrating at exactly the same frequency with a well-defined frequency and um, damping. And those all those modes are completely independent of each other. They each act like an individual spring mass oscillator. So the A0, CBR, B1 minus, B1 plus, is it acts just like a, a very simple string mass oscillator and has a a, a response just like that uh, of the individual ones. They're completely independent of each other. Um, and so then they don't interact. So you end up with a very simple system. Um, um, uh, 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 that, that one can do the measurements with. And I, I, now I want to go on to start talking about the actual um, modes that are affected by the base bar. Now we've been all hearing about that. Now we can compute that on computer models. Um, my simple computer model was um, basically the inner outline of the Titian Strad and the arch plates. And one of the things you can do is put a base bar inside it and ask yourself what happens to the modal frequencies um, that are shown here um, as, as a function of base bar strength. And the base bar strength here is a very simple um, base bar, which has a rectangular um, top section. Uh, so, uh, um, sorry, a straight top section. It's got no fancy profile. It, it's it, the it, it has a different thickness along the length because it it follows it's the line here that you can actually see along here it follows the profile of the top plate itself um, but it has a flat flat top to it and what I can do that will have the same all we're interested in is how does the base bar affect the modes of the violin. So I'm not worried too much about the details. I just want to know what happens. For example, if you turn the base bar on and off, and you can do that very easily with, with finite element analysis of, of uh, on a computer. And I've just changed the base bar mass here um, by from 0.1, uh, its general uh, normal size to 10 times that. So no, no small changes, this is big changes. What would happen if you changed the reduce the base bar um, strength by a factor of 10 to 0.1? This is what would happen to the CBR mode. This is what happens to the breathing mode, virtually no change at all. And this would and it's only these modes up here that get higher frequency that get appreciable things. So this would actually suggest that the base bar has a relatively small effect. <clears throat> and if you look if you look at the, the measurements, in fact, that Joseph showed, we're talking about um, one, one uh, much less than 2 dB. And that, that's the minimum amount that you can actually hear, even over a well-trained ear. So it, it has a surprisingly small effect on the signature modes. But it has a much larger effect, in fact, on the island area. Um, using the same computation on the simple model, um, you can see the sorts of modes of the island area here. There, there's a rocking mode of the, uh, at 450 hertz here, just uh, as it rocks backwards and forwards. This is a low frequency rocking mode. George talked about that. Um, <clears throat> and so you'll find the base bar actually affects this. And what this plot is, is a plot of, in fact, of now, the base bar being changed by, um, from naught point, uh, from zero. Um, this is uh, this is now a skeleton curve. It actually shows, like Jim Woodhouse has shown that it's able to do, a skeleton on, on the model I'm using of, of the filtering action of the um, the island area, so the island area um, is the main source of, of um, mechanism by which the vibrating strings 
take their energy from their, their vibrations into the plates themselves, but it always comes via the bridge. And that's why, in principle, you might think that the rocking frequency at the top of the bridge, which is um, uh, is incredibly important. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but there's all sorts of other um, resonances of the bridge. Here's another one here where you can see it's the top the top region of the island here that's rocking backwards and forwards. And the bass bar is running along here and it's going to have an effect on those like that. There's more, more, more sorts of effects like this that you can get um, asymmetric modes when um, one side, because it's an asymmetric system, because it, here we've got a sound based in position that, that stops the motion on this side largely. So you can get this happening um, with this side of the, the, pro, the island air vibrating, which is small air, that will be at a high frequency, uh, or just this side of the, the, um, um, uh, the island air vibrating. So we've got really quite a complicated system here, um, and, but it's all important in determining how the energy from the vibrating strings gets into the body of the instrument. And the, uh, what, what's it, the, what this is showing is that um, <clears throat> there's a lot that this this is the the, the admittance. Um, how, how much um, me measured at the center uh, of the um, bridge, top of the bridge, measured in in the horizontal direction. And you can see um, you, you you get a, um, a, a lot of um, without a sound post, this is the um, uh, curve here with the dotted one, that's naught, and you can see the effect of the sound post is really to reduce um, the, 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 the size of this when, when you get up to dub, double the amount, um, um, the, the double the strength of the, um, of the bass bar. No sound post here, and as you increase the size, uh, the, Colin, the, Colin, uh, are you saying soundpost when you mean bass bar? Yes, I am. I'm sorry. That's why I corrected it in my last sentence. Okay. Yes. Uh, no, there's no soundpost here. Where to, uh, I apologize. What, what we're t increasing here is the bass bar, um, from not being there at all to being there to twice as twice the size of a normal um, bass bar. And you can see that it has an effect not on the um, <clears throat> um, uh, the signature modes. There's a, another strong mode here at about two kilohertz, which is like this mode here. Um, there's another mode at a much higher frequency up here, and another mode um, at um, five kilohertz. And so there's a lot of activity in this sort of area that one might expect. So, thank you, Jim, that was important. Um, um, but now we're talking about normal modes and normal modes where these are the modes that one actually sees in radiation measurements. This is a rather famous set of um, measurements that Joseph made um, on the directional behavior of um, the radiation. And it's a superposition of the um, radiation uh, measured around the bridge um, in, in, um, uh, uh, in 12 different directions. And you can see at low frequencies, um, uh, it's not, not it's relatively isotropic uh, monopole radiation, when you get a long way away, it is. If you're close by, you get shading effects uh, of the um, the shape of the instrument, which, which cause these uh, slight differences here. But when you get above about a kilohertz, um, you get high directional properties, um, and um, uh, it, 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 these modes around here are still thing modes that you can recognize and the maker has some control over. And in principle, you've got control of things in this region here 
uh, 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 the bridge uh, and um, the island area. Here are uh, examples now of typical measurements that we make with the, uh, the equipment that I showed you. Um, and um, you can see the A0, you can see a CBR mode, a B1 minus and a B1 plus mode. Um, you get the, the, the dip in um, uh, output that you normally expect. And if we look at it um, over a, a lot larger range here at four kilohertz, you see um, a, a re re again related co complicated pattern, but you see all the resonances of the normal modes. The black, the black everywhere here is the the starting um, um, with, with the full height and the full um, profile, um, and the other colors are the me the measurements that you make um, with it when when it has been um, reduced. Um, and um, we're just in, for just this is just one measurement, um, and and uh, you 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 can see a, a large amount of scatter, not very much scatter um, down here. Um, George also has showed us some some measurements that you might not recognize so easily of the um, me measurements you can make of the. Uh, output of the, uh, the, the 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 measurement of the pressure the the acoustic center here, and what you can see is that you see the it, it's a normal mode. It has a well defined, beautiful um, uh, um, a peak like this, and this is this called the resistive peak. That's in phase quadrature with the force that's exciting it, and um, this is the dispersive part. It's this part that's associated with energy transfer. Um, this this part here is um, associates with, in a sense, certain sense, with the air that goes in and out with the, where the plates, but it doesn't radiate. It's what's called the near field. But you can see here you, you've got the B one minus mode, and you've got a B two mode, um, and you've got the dispersion modes here, and you've got the um, <clears throat> the air that's basically now coming out of the F holes, which is in the opposite phase. And you can see it's in the opposite phase. And that, this is showing absolutely the ideal behavior from these measurements that you expect um, <clears throat> from, from the measurements. Um, there, there, were, there was a slight problem to start with in the measurements on the laser interferometer. Um, nothing to do with the, the people that were measuring it. But there was a problem with the commercial software that was doing funny things with the phase. So it it, it really wasn't. It should have given uh, pictures that are rather like that um, in in the admittance um, that you, from the laser reformator. But they they had to go to quite some problems, I think, in, in curing that. But uh, so the the experiments in all the experiments were useful in in all sorts of ways, and that's one of them. This is a superposition of um, all the instruments uh, that, that were, were measured, the five instruments that we used with the changes in profile. And uh, so this can look for, for generically now for features. We're looking for generic features, not the small features that were happening down here, uh, with, uh, um, uh, but, uh, but over the whole range. And um, there's lots of dips and the peaks and things like that. And there's a big dip here, which we'll come back to in a minute. And then uh, they, these sorts of dips and things disappear. Um, we, we, um, you get rather just rather noisy type things um, in this region. It's not noise. It's just that, that you can't predict what, what, what sort of um, overall features it might have other than the general slope. So, um, Carrying on, this is the same sort of information. Um, it shows just for the, the measurements with the base bar with a height. So there's no generic difference between changing heights, not not, not the ma major differences in, in changing the heights or profiles. You, you, you still come up with, with the superposition of all, all the measurements with much the same sorts of looking information. 
you can do a bit better by saying, right, you can average these. And I've, I, I've shown the averages um, here for, um, you, you can look at these in detail. This is a lot of detail here. And I mean, to describe things, I can only focus on, on the major points, but you can see the same generic features on all the instruments here. These are the transition modes. Um, this, um, uh, no, sorry, the, these are the B1 minus and B1 plus modes. Here's the transition modes uh, um, in, in this range that starts around about 800 hertz uh, up to about 1.5 kilohertz. And then you've got something like a bridge hill um, over here. It's often referred to just simply the bridge hill. Um, but I, that, that, that identification of a bridge hill is in my mind should be called the bridge island hill because the, it's the island area that is so important in de determining the, the filtering action between the strings and the body of the instrument. And this is just an, uh, an example of the individual um, measurements of, um, and you can see, and I'm just going to focus entirely on this feature here, which is this dip at 300, around about 300 hertz, which, ah, oh, you might think might be something to you, do. You mean three kilohertz? Sorry? You mean three kilohertz? Three, three, thousand, three kilohertz, sorry, three kilohertz. It might be something to do with, with the, the Bridge Hill. And I mean, um, uh, you can see it in all the instruments. That's the, the, the base bar feature. This is the same one with the Bridge Rocking uh, frequency um, feature. Now this is the one, I ha haven't got this. This is the pro profile one. Um, so um, one wonders what it might be. And if it, uh, what, I, uh, there was some, um, I've done some measurements on um, both my own VM violin and, uh, and George's Stepani violin to just try and help that. And what I've done is, uh, is done measurements with the strings damped and undamped. Now, I'm, we've come to start doing all our measurements with damping the strings. But by damping the strings, one's losing a huge amount of important information. One's losing the information about the energy transfer from the vibrating strings and the sympathetic strings to the, um, the, to, to the sound of the, the instrument. And what, I've, what you can see here is when you add the strings, you get some very narrow resonances. Um, uh, this, the D1 corresponds to the first partial of the open D string. G2 is the second partial of the G string. A1 is, the, is at 440, as you can see. Um, that, that is the uh, first partial of the A string. Then um, the second partial of the D string coincides, or it would have done if it was well tuned, um, with G, the G3, the third partial, etc. Whoops, sorry, I've got to go back again to that one. And um, you, you can see uh, superimposed on the generic um, uh, thing, uh, the dance strings, you've got now these extra string resonances. So you can see the effect of string resonances. Now they're narrow string resonances. So when you excite them, um, by the bowed string or by tapping, you get these long lasting um, because it's a narrow resonance. It means it, it rings for a long time. Um, and and um, if you're playing the instrument and bowing it, um, uh, you've got huge changes in amplitude. So when you're doing vibrato on a note around about these frequencies, you get a tremendously large change in amplitude within the period of the note. So it gives a sensitivity to the string that comes alive. Um, and that's what, what players often comment about instruments. That, um, so um, uh, so I, I, I think, uh, I, I, I believe that one really ought to make measurements with strings on uh, uh, undamped and damped because I, I believe that a lot of information of importance to the potential 
um, sound of the violin is, is lost by damping the strings and by averaging in any way um, uh, 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 over directions or, or, or um, different types of excitation. Um, and the interesting thing is that if one goes to higher frequencies, and this is using this very simple apparatus, um, you can measure, uh, th these are measurements up to 4K. And I can follow through, or we can follow through all the resonances of the strings right up to the 18th partial of the G string, which is, um, um, I'm not absolutely certain that that is, is, is that, but up, up, up until certainly round about three kilohertz, one can easily see each partial of each of the four strings, giving these ringing, um, very narrow resonances, which you must excite when you pluck a string or are excited in any way. But then you get to this big dip here, which is seen in virtually all the instruments that we've looked at. And um, then they disappear. Occasionally, perhaps one comes through, it's just possible the 11th partial of the G string comes through for some reason, which I, could, I couldn't count. But it does really look very much as though what is actually happening is that, that this is associated with the, uh, the damped rocking frequency. And um, normally you think of the resonances of giving you peaks, but the, oh. this, is a, this is in fact a dip. And a rational, in my view, um, interpretation of this is that when you put tap the instrument, you're putting it in, in a certain amount of energy, which is shared between all the radiating modes and the non-radiating modes um, of, of, the, of the instrument. So that when you excite strongly um, the um, rocking frequency, you're taking energy away from what could otherwise have been radiated. So now we get in fact a minimum, not a maximum. You can't, you can't increase the amount of radiation you get from, uh, uh, from, from exciting that. And all these minimum that you're actually seeing from the strings is that they're all extracting energy that could otherwise be radiated. And that forms a, a consistent picture, in fact, of um, uh, how the violin is operating. And, and it's a little different, I think, from the one that we generally accept, that, that the, for example, that the, the Bridge Hill uh, um, um, peak is caused by the rocking frequency. And there's, in fact, M what the measurements suggest is that it's a a, a, a bridge valley um, from the rocking frequency rather rather than that, and the, the actual the general overall peak is a, is associated with the the resonances of the um, the island area in general, and not just of uh, um, the the, the um, top of the bridge. Now, Colin, I just want to I'd clarify. Like to leave it there. Colin, just want to clarify. When you say the rocking frequency, you're talking about the rocking frequency of the bridge. Is that correct? No, I'm, not, no, no, what, no, I'm talking what? about the rocking frequency which everyone refers to, which is the which very is top of the bridge. Just the top of the bridge relative right. okay. to its waist. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I was using the, the normal way of talking about the rocking frequency of the bridge. Yeah. But, but the, the bridge itself, um, uh, I, as I was there on a previous slide, has has a main in-plane frequency um, mode of it's rigid up until nearly three kilohertz. And then, then you can excite the top of the bridge, which is very light relative to it. Um, and, um, and that rocks at, at, at um, around about three, three kilohertz. Now, this... I may I may be completely wrong, uh, but it this at least gives a consistent picture um, uh, uh, that, that could could explain these results. Um, and I, I I can't say 
I, I can't say much more than that, but I'm, I have other experiments in which put masses on top of the bridge, and, and that, um, if you want to hear about it, um, uh, allows the B1 minus frequency, the breathing mode, to change down to almost as low in the measurements I've done, down to A0, leaving all the other resonances unchanged. And, it, and this is a brand new result. Um, uh, and I mean, it's, it's incredibly important because it, it actually really strengthens one's view of what the um, bridge is doing. Um, uh, not the, uh, the bridge and the island area is, is actually doing in affecting the, the sound of an instrument. And basically, the, the, um, putting a mute on top of the, the bridge has, ha, has a huge effect and it, bring, it brings down the um, it brings down the breathing mode to um, overlap and split the um, CBR mode. Um, and the, the B1 plus mode disappears because it's it, because it, it's no longer coupled strongly to the breathing mode. So I think these are all really very important results that have, have you know, in a sense, surprised me. Um, uh, um, um, I'd like to share that with people before I pop off. Could I, a question? Um, yeah, thank you, Colin. <laughs> Uh, well, a comment. First, if you if you look at the radiation of of a hundred violins, let's say, and overlap them, you will indeed see a, a dip um, at about two point nine kilohertz. That's why I put my band cut off there. Um, yeah. It is it is nowhere near um, as pronounced as this, though. Yours is going down. I mean, what twenty kilohertz? Yes, but, I yes, mean, twenty but, dB. Yeah, but but are you talking about radiation measurements? I am. Yeah, the, the problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, um, uh, the the problem with that that's every, that's averaging over all directions. Yes. And 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 uh, so, I mean, it's it, it, it's a different. Uh, this is a different measurement, but it's very sensitive, as you can see, to that dip. But um, isn't that one of the underlying principles of? of your measurements that it can be related to the other ones well well, well yes but we, um absolutely so how does but but, 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 but yes but it, uh, but but, it, but but it's not it it isn't it is not doing what you're doing uh, in in terms of you're not you're measuring over all sorts of directions mm -hmm. and averaging things this this is a point measurement mm -hmm. Okay, um, and, it, and, 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 it, and it's still, I mean, I'm saying it's a useful measurement, and, and uh, certainly um, uh, the, the, the point that I was making before is if we look at all these modes here, um, uh, and measure the derivatives of the pressure that you measure along the central line, you're only talking here about the symmetric modes and not the anti-symmetric modes. That that, that, that the, you obviously measure as well. All right. Okay. Um, and that that would that would halve the effect. Okay, fair enough. But the other um, thing that occurs to me is, if you hypothesize that this is the bridge rocking frequency creating a dip, isn't that in in um, contradiction of 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 Jim's model, where it's a. Peak. Well, I'd like Jim. I'd like Jim to come in and comment. Jim, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to comment? Please. Um, I mean, it would need some calculations. It'll be there in the model if that's what it is. Um, yeah. The thing this is reminding me of, for those who remember the the days of Carleen Hutchins. Um. Do you remember her having a vogue for the A1, B1 delta? Yes. So she was doing internal sound measurements yes. to determine the A1 frequency, but she had been given slightly iffy advice, and she was measuring a dip for that frequency, 
not the peak. And that dip is at the rigid wall A1 frequency, not the actual node frequency of A1. Uh, uh, now, I wonder if you're getting something. You may be right in your interpretation so that this is the, the clamped foot um, uh, yes. bending Good. frequency giving a dip, whereas the actual um, dynamic behavior gives the peak. Yeah, there, there, there is in fact um, a dip here at the A0 frequency. A, sorry, A1, A, A1, which is the one uh, that we're measuring near a node. Um, oh, yeah, that, 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 that's a different, uh, that, that's a different thing. No, it is, uh, it, it is the, the interesting thing uh, it, it is that um, you, 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 the A1 frequency, um, the A1 mode is a very important mode. It would be if it could radiate. But the only modes that in fact radiate in this region that we're showing on, on the screen at the moment are, are effectively monopole modes. Oh, um, sure. Uh, that, because that's because a... the dipole mode, um, because it's a dipole, um, it, 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 the two ends of a dipole operate in opposite phase and cancel out. So they mean, don't radiate the, the, very strongly. The, the, but, that's true, but it's not the point I was making. I was making the point that she was that a, an internal uh, you you can get um, the the dip frequency and the peak frequency tell you two different things. In the case of A1, the dip frequency told you the rigid wall, A0, A1, and the peak gave you the actual normal mode of A1, which is shifted a little by the compliance of the plates. And I suspect you're seeing the same thing up at the yeah. bridge rocking frequency. You're seeing a dip maybe around the clamped foot frequency, um, but there's also a peak, which is what shows up as the bridge hill in other measurements. Yeah. George? Well, very possibly. I, I, yeah. Collins uh, oh. partially answered it. So am I okay to talk? Go oh, ahead, yeah, George. Uh, Colin uh, partially uh, answered the this question, but uh, it's worth pointing out that the microphone in that position measures where there's uh, pressure changes in that location. But there are substantial pressure changes in other locations around the corpus, and from other measurements, we know that the the monopole radiation component is uh, only really important below about a kilohertz. Although you get some reemergences of it higher, but you know, above twelve hundred hertz, there's, the volume change has gone, and there, it's just that there's so many other radiation mechanisms that. Uh, you know, when we look at the external sound compared to the internal sound, we're going to get a different picture. Well, and because I, 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 I by other other means, so I, we, I, it will vanish, but but it will be for that reason alone. For that simple reason, it will be smaller. And by the way, that violin's two thousand and eleven, not two thousand. Oh, sorry, that was a misprint. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um. There, there is, uh, while I'm speaking, uh, the, the, one, the, one the, other thing that you talked about that you haven't put in here is you did have a diagram where you showed the effect of uh, increasing the base bar and the sound post together and showing the influence of that on the Bridge Hill. I would, I would quite like to have seen that in this talk. I, I, saw, I saw half of it. I, I, I agree, but there's a limit to time. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I go on too long always. <laughs> yeah. So, Colin, on on this particular slide, I just want to clarify the right hand graph that yep. is without a sound post. Yes. That, there's there's no sound post. Okay, so the caption is an error. I that that is that that is terrible. That is terrible. And that that that, that is. A, a typing mistake. Okay, let's only clarify no, that. Good catch. It, it's so far offset. It's not. It, 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 what it, what it should have is no no offset at the sound post. That, no. that 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 is a correction, and thank you for pointing it out. Um. Uh, oh, actually, no, no. no or, um, 
Or you think that there is a sound post? Does it look at your original paper? No, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that this one here I took to be no sound post. You're no, drawing the sound no, post no, no, in the graphics. No, no, sorry, you're confusing me. It is with the offset sound post. The offset sound post is there to start with there. And um, we're turning on, in fact. This was the whole point of, uh, of this, in a sense. that We're turning... Uh, the, 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 the dash curve is without sound post. You will ask yourself what happens now um, when you put the base bar in. What the base bar does is reduce this peak here, and it increases these peaks here. And it gets back to a situation where there's a, 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 a sort of peak here, nearly th around about three kilohertz, which is much more nearly. This is an admitt admittance measurement. So admittance measurements are different from, from sound measurements. Um, and it goes back, in fact, to what Jim was saying. Um, but so so th this is much more like getting a, th a three kilohertz because in in the model the the resonance was uh, of the top of the bridge the rocking frequency was set at three kilohertz. It you've now got, you've got it's missing entirely here. Um, without the base bar. But when you when you bring the base bar in, um, because, because it rocks mostly to one side, when, when you bring the base bar in, it, it has the, the effect of supporting both feet of the bridge now. Uh, without it, only one foot of the bridge was being supported. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, with with a, a constraint. And now with it, um, you've now got a, a situation much more like the uh, the sound the the bridge uh, um, being on a, a fairly rigid um, base, so that you measure what you would actually measure the the um, the, the rocking frequency at the top of the bridge. But you still do you think that so I, uh, I I wondered in fact. If if the purpose of the base bar was in fact to compensate at high frequencies um, the the the, um, the effect of the sound post, so that you you actually restored the rocking frequency, and this would have, remember this is admittance and not 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 sound radiation. Sure. Um, you, you expect to see a peak as the, as the top of the bridge rocks backwards and forwards. That will go through a peak without a doubt that will, 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 will give you a, a peak rather than a dip. But I'm saying that, that because you, you're feeding energy into the, um, the vibrations, the, the amount of energy that you've got available that from the original impulse, all that energy that's going into that is going to go to a dip in the radiated sound. Okay, so just um, to clear it all up, it's intentional that the left side has no sound post and the right side has a sound post. Because one would assume that this was an illustration. One was the illustration of the other. No, no, but... the, 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 this, this is this is correct. This has a this has a sound post. Okay, and the other side the, doesn't. It's correct. Yeah. It's got an offset sound post, but it doesn't have it to start with. It doesn't have a base bar. This is the effect of the base bar. Yes. Good. Good. Which is big. Could I ask? Yeah. Could I it ask? Take, takes sorry. away energy from 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 the radiated sound. Because you've got a limited amount of energy available. So, Colin, just relating more to, from the violin maker's point of view, did you um, try and track the changes from um, stage one to stage five by internal mic measurement? And do they predict the same sort of things as the radiation ones? Yes, yeah, so that, that's that's in fact exactly what I was doing. In the first part of the talk, I, well, not the first part when I was talking about that, um, all all these measurements here 
are, are tracking it. So what can you say? What? No, because I, I I can't say very much because the change, the changes that you were observing, were were one or two dB, which are so small uh, um, that that I, I I wouldn't have confidence in in, in my measurements. My, my measurements are pretty re reproducible, in fact, but um, uh, I. I'm, you've done averages over things so that you can actually get qualitative results, and you were getting changes of the base bar of 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 less than one 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 dB. And since the limit that uh, hearing that you uh, anyone acutely unsensitive a listener is about two or three dB. It would, blah, blah, blah. it would suggest that the, the, the bass bar is not making much difference to the sound of the instrument. I have to disagree with that. The fact that an yes, average, <laughs> move, if the fact that an average moves up half a dB, if you look at the the peak, can vary by four dB, six dB. It's yes, just, well, it's, it's well, narrower. I could no, I I couldn't I couldn't agree more because I mean, with with with, with, with when, when you do an average of of things that are varying as much as these, and we know that these are. These are shifting um, uh, with the base bar. Um, uh, uh, the, the average won't change very much, but but the actual in, individual uh, peaks will change. I've said that that, that the putting the base bar in does call, call, cause um, small changes, but they're very small. Well, that but that in. Saying that to a group of violin makers, a small change in the bass bar can have a vast um, um, effect on the sellability of I, the instrument. I mean, or well, the well, yes, I can because it's not, uh, uh, but but it's particularly in the uh, uh, as it affects yeah, the so, Bridge Island area. Yeah, yes, so I think Island Colin area. is 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 speaking in physics terms in terms of. Um, you know, answering the question, which, you know, I have, what is the primary purpose of the base bar and what is his function? Yep. And, and what he's saying is that it, it seems to me from his talk is that uh, uh, one of the things you do need in the violin is to have this asymmetrical behavior, you know, of the transmission of the string vibration forces to the corpus. And the main function or, or the, the, the main thing that, that, causes this asymmetry is the sound post and that the bass bar plays a much smaller role in the asymmetry. And what he's saying is that the sound post is, made, is making a much larger effect in the bridge island area than the signature modes. I but agree with that. Bass bar, I, okay, so, the bass bar. So, I agree. So, so when he says that the, 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 the bass bar is making a very small effect in the lower frequency signature modes, he's, he's not saying that those small effects are not important you know, from a violin making point of view, but from a physics point of view, the function of the bass bar affects the bridge island area much more so than the signature areas. Oh. Yes, that, 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 is, I, that is a good summary. That yeah. may be true, but the purpose of the experiment wasn't to find the underlying reason for having a bass bar at all. It was to see how the output varied with the base bar, and are you saying, Colin, that this technique is not up to measuring that? No, that... I, 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 this technique is absolutely showing that. So can you, but, but it's just you haven't gotten around to drawing a conclusion. Well, I thought I had, but never mind. What was um, your conclusion, though? Well, my my conclusion is uh, exa exa exactly uh, as I'm fan was saying. Is that the, the the effect of the base bar is very important, as I showed on the thing, the, the slide that was up for a long time, with, with the dash thing with no no base bar and then double the, the um, uh, that that was a study of what what the base bar does yeah. to the the island area. Okay, uh, and, it, and and it's important and and it's going to affect the sound of the instrument. Hugely. Yeah, so I I think um the the the. The question Joseph is asking, though, so, so what you just showed us was based on your computer simulations. I think what Joseph is interested in is, well, does your internal cavity measurements support that? 
And it seems to me that what you're saying is that you, um, right now, your, your internal cavity measurements in the higher frequencies um, has enough uncertainty that you're unable to extract out that information right now, just, I would say, you know, looking at it with an eye. Yeah. yeah. So, so is it possible with more, you yeah. know, processing or, um, you know, of well, this data that, that yeah. your, your measurements will also yeah. be consistent well, with your simulations? I, I've, I've, I've only concentrated on this. There are other areas here where, 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 um, there's dip, dip, dips as well, but the, uh, but these 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 are these are common features of the violin that are in a, in a certain sense independent of the um, bass power, and so re, I, I'm saying that the bass power is really much less important than than, than is generally thought. Um. Well. How can you say that something that's vital is less important than th thought? Uh, it, it doesn't yeah. make. No, uh, no, I, I, I agree. I agree with. I, I understand. Uh, I understand what you're saying, um, and that's why I put a big question mark over it. Okay. Oh, that particular feature. I, that's an interesting finding. I don't. I'm not arguing about that. Um, but and you you support that from your own measurements, but it's yeah. smaller in the radiation measurements. Yes, there there I'd say there's definitely something happening there, and I would love to, um, I would love to know what causes that as well as various other dips, and and so this is useful in that it shows it in a in a stronger form. So um, I, I I salute that, but I'm more you introduced this as an inexpensive way for violin makers to measure these yes. things, um, well, they but but violin makers will want to know. Which bass bar worked better in some sense, and 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 to I, say I, you're showing that by overlaying I, I, everything I, I, on I, top of each other isn't the I, same as interpreting it. Well, sorry, but I I I I can't help them because I because from all the measurements that I make, I cannot see um, um, where the where the um, where the bass bar is in fact causing a major effect. On 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 the sound output. So and and I mean, it, it, if it has uh, 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 an effect on the radiation, I would expect to see it on the internal sound, because the, the, the uh, because um, it would if it the the both the, both the internal sound and the external sound uh, are are generated by the same plate vibrations. So you're saying that you don't believe it's there in the radiated sound? I mean, I, I thought I, he I, just said, yeah, I thought he just said that he, he, he doesn't see this in his internal cavity measurements. Uh, you know, my question is, um, you know, what analysis or processing has he actually done on his measurements? You know, did he take... I was going to say, well, it, surely it... It, the, the plot you've got here is super, superimposing all right. the stages of all the base bars. If you yeah. did what Joseph did with them, which is to average all the stage ones, all the stage twos, all the stage yeah, three. No, well, but I, but I, uh, if I want to see what the effect of the, the, the base bar is, it, it's easier for me to look at the first, first and fifth, right. rather than uh, because you would expect that to be the largest effect. That is why entirely I use this slide here, and I, I um, this is the average. This is this is for the base bar profile, and that's for the base base bar height profile. This is the average now of of all five violins. First of all, um, um, uh, yeah. So, so Colin, I mean, by by eyeballing it, could be wrong, but just a gross eyeballing it. The left two graphs seems to be consistent with your simulations because it seems yeah. like the the final height, which is the lowest height, seems to be on average to have lower output above yeah. one kilohertz than step one, right? But 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 can I can I can I also go back because that's an average now, yeah. and you can see that the, the 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 this is step one and this is step five. 
Now you can see that there are changes between step one and step five. So I'm not denying that. It's showing you those changes. Is the right-hand plot the, the, the scoop? No, the, 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 they're both the same thing, except for oh. the, 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 uh, the left-hand plot is for the um, uh, the height, and the, the um, right-hand plot is for the profile. Now, in both of them, you can see that they're, they're not identical. So there has been a change. So, uh, but now you, you tell me what those changes are. I can't interpret that because um, they're, they're very different. Look, you've got two peaks here and you've got a single peak here. You've still got that one there. You've got this peak that's sharpened. You've got, you've still got these gen generic sort of uh, transition period, the thing, uh, and the bridge hill sort of thing. As, well, as yeah, but as sort but of as a first step. As a first step. We know that all violins are different. Uh, and so, so, but, but, um, so these two violins would well, well sound different from each other, from, yeah. from the first step to the second step. So, in other words, the bass bar is making a difference. It, it, I mean, I, the, this shows that the bass bar is making a difference uh, on all the instruments. But, well, but, 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 but it's it, the difference is to individual modes. And therefore, and they're at such high frequency modes, it's very difficult to have control or say what you're doing. Well, of course, with individual modes, but so as Joseph I, has done, you know, with, with can, his... can you tell me which of these two is the better violin? No, no, yes. but, but 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 one of the, the things that um, you know Joseph has done with his uh, you know radi you know acoustic radiation measurements oh. is to take some band averages to see if there's any patterns. As an example, sorry, I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't hear that. Uh, sorry, J J Joseph was wrong there. It's not the top one. Notice that the decibel scale is different on the two plots. Oh, really? The top of yes. this one is sixty dBs. The sixty I'm, dB I'm, line yeah. is well ah. down on this one. Ah, okay. So the so. bottom one has much more stuff going above the level which the top one doesn't reach. And sorry, that's what I have expect. some. I have some plots where I put the sixty in, and they're not there. I yeah. do apologize. But it's um, but this is saying that the step five average is a little higher in the lowest band, not what... uh, roughly the same in the transition hill band and a little higher in the bridge hill band. Isn't that rather similar to what Joseph got? Yes, I, I would. Think... Well, yes and no. The, the thing we find always with taking the base bar height down is that the base goes up. Um, I mean, yeah. if you average enough things out, so that that I don't doubt at all. Now that you've you've corrected me on the scaling there, so that makes perfect sense. What happens in the Bridge Hill area is it varies from step to step, and not a linear way. Otherwise, step two wouldn't be what I would define as the better by a particularly narrow definition of more energy in all bands. Um, so, as makers, we want to know, to my mind, that. Um, how is what we do affecting oh, the energy output people, at different bands? Oops. George, Stefani, maybe you can throw some light yeah. on this. It's a good button for a moment. Uh, on the um, the plot with the uh, offset sound post and the bass bar going from sort of uh, naught to two, uh, I think this does show what we hear. I, uh, so without uh, without the bass bar, you have a bit more output in the uh, signature mode region and uh, stuff missing elsewhere. And with, uh, as you add the bass bar, you increase the output in the, in the three kilohertz and the four kilohertz or five kilohertz uh, peak. So I think that this, this does actually correspond to what we hear when we change the size of a bass bar. Isn't that isn't that right? I mean, am I misinterpreting it here? That that uh, definitely, if we look at say the uh, the the one the number one line, um, you know, that's very different from the naught base bar. Absolutely, isn't it? So we're seeing exactly that. We're seeing a loss a loss in the lower frequencies and a, a boost in the high frequencies. 
And it certainly is, I would strongly agree with Colin that this is on a mode by mode basis, which is what makes it so hard to really pick out what the significant differences are. And, and I found in my modal analysis measurements, there was a case where one quite low frequency mode was very distinctly present and unambiguous, uncontroversial, was present in, in the analysis, but uh, only in one instance. So change the base bar, it vanished again. So other, other modes, particularly high frequencies, they're shuffling around, they're mixing together in different ways. And those may be uh, features about their particular configuration are something that we're uh, sensitive to in addition to the overall level in the bands. Yeah. But I don't know this because this is a, a lot of experimental psychoacoustic work to do there to determine if that's actually true or whether right. it's just a, a fantasy. Can, can I just come back in again and, and really just to agree with um, <clears throat> um, with Joseph because uh, and with the comment if you look at this I mean uh, uh, as George was just saying what you're up to, you're, you've got a high peak here you've got a low peak here um, no, no peak at all and the energy is going well oh, blasted um as, as <clears throat> so what what one is changing as you if you're just concentrating on this is the tonal balance and i'm by taking an average over this range here you can see you're, you're increasing that so without a doubt the base bar is increasing the amount of uh, uh, activity let me just call it activity at the moment um between about 2.5 up to about four kilohertz from the from, from the from the bridge hill and um, but it's decreasing the low frequency so if you if you want to get a balance in some way between that the tonal balance will certainly be dependent on the bass bar i would agree entirely with what, what um joseph was saying and it um, will well, change from violin to the violin well well I, i'm glad to hear that but and also these skeleton graphs they are so important what you've done um and they rhyme very nicely with Jim's one of the Bridge Hill. Um, so these have been sort of burned into my mind as a model of what to do. Um, I mean, how to um, adjust instruments. At the same time, step two in the um, base bar height experiment um, produced um, on average the most across the range. So it was more in the base than the very low base bar i would so there's some other factors there that are balancing out it's you you can't just it doesn't it seems to me it doesn't work as simply as this i wish it did well, the, this this the, this this graph here is mm -hmm. a generic model basically yes, yes. i mean it, it's purposely getting rid of um all all, all the uh, multiplicity of um, um, plate vibrations by actually putting lots of damping into them, so that um, uh, the the energy flows out from the um, this region here into the body of the instrument. So you're just left with what what essentially and disappears. So it uh, and is is absorbed. So it works out how much energy is actually flowing out from the uh, the island area, which is which is a very important feature of the violin. And yet that tracks pretty well, I think, what happens when looking at a lot of violins averaged out, even from the radiation point of view. If you look at it um, just in terms of average base, um, um, B1 frequency, for example, similar, very similar things happen. The, you know, the upper hill goes down, the bridge hill goes up, then the lower hill, I mean, the, yeah. Um, so yeah, this, this is a, a trend you see from a lot of points of view. Um, anyway, um, I would be interested in in arranging your internal averages in the same way as I did mine, just to see if they give the same, I mean, nominal results. Yeah. It would be interesting to know that. The admittance ones didn't. The, the admittance were a little confusing sometimes. Um, not to say that, you know, one should be given priority. It's just good to know what they're what they'll all predict if 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 you're going to use it as a measuring system. Um and thank you, Colin. Um, are there questions? Hmm. 
<laughs> I guess we turn it over to the fan. You want to officially turn it over to? Um, yeah. Are there, are there any questions from uh, the participants? Um, if not, I, I may go back to one of the uh, little can of worms, <laughs> 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 which was um, uh, Colin. If if you have a um, you know if, you, if one of your theories in, of that three kilohertz dip is the bridge rocking frequency, it seems to me that's fairly easy to um, um, measure. Because you can just change the bridge rocking frequency. I, I agree and entirely. It follows it. What? I, I mean, I, I, this is this is new work, mm -hmm. um, in a sense, and I haven't had a chance to do that, except that I actually have um, done the measurements, um, uh, but I haven't analysed in detail. Um, in fact, one uh, uh, the, the the measurements that I made, in fact, of putting mass on the top of the bridge in the way of a, a, a mute. Uh, automatically changes that, uh, and um, what I need to go back to. So that's why I've, I've left a slight question mark um, about things. But I mean, it was interesting that um, Joseph said that he sees it that that dip in his own measurements. But I, 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 I yeah, yeah. No, I, I think the the dip is a, a real physical feature, an acoustic feature, no doubt about it, based on all the measurements everybody's done. These, so the only question is what, what's causing it? You know, why is but, but, it, but, why is but it so the, consistent? Energy, uh, because, because I can see all the resonances of the string harmonics, they are a measure of, of energy being lost to the system. And, and I mean, it, it, uh, the fact you can see them right up to these sorts of frequencies is seeing that anything that's actually giving uh, a, a, res a, a resonance that's actually going to absorb energy that would otherwise be radiated. There's no evidence of a, of a very big um, feature other, other than mm -hmm. that dip. Yeah, yeah. And oh. and it may it may it may be just a coincidence that it happens to be close to the um, on on so many instruments the rocking frequency uh, 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 of the of the the bridge it's a little That's higher than rocking. well it's a little higher than well, the ad admittance bridge hill yeah which is usually about 2.5 or lower yours is at 2.8 so does that but my, my assertion is that is that uh, we don't need to speculate about the causes that, because, that, we I, have, I, because we can certainly rule out whether it is the bridge island area through some simple experiment i mean the the rocking mode of the bridge i agree i, I agree something in here yeah. I agree. Could, could, could I could I put something in here? Sure, um, please. The, the frequencies are the way around you'd expect if Colin's speculation is correct. The actual bridge hill, the bridge hill is always lower than the rocking frequency because the rocking frequency is defined by clamped feet, and the mm. compliance of the island always reduces it. So th that's the right way around. The, the bridge hill is lower. Sometimes it's down as low as two kilohertz. Um, the, this this rocking this this dip is as you say more like three kilohertz, which is higher. Um, now, Joseph, surely you've got some data that could investigate this because in an earlier year, you did an Oberlin thing on bridges and recording F rock for various things. So, haven't you got measurements where you deliberately changed the rocking frequency? And can you see, can you have a look back at that and see if the dip that you see moves with that rocking frequency? Um, those were um, George Bissinger's measurements and they were um, radiation measurements, um, five microphones in front. And with radiations, you don't see things moving. You see just the pike, the, the peak heights changing. But um, you're saying that you see it a bit in your radiation measurements. Yeah, yes. If you... Um, if you average, um, can, actually, let me go back. Can I go back? Can I share the screen a minute? Yeah, go ahead. Um, when you I'll turn mine off. Stop. I, I, I heard it. I've turned mine off. Um, so.
Okay, can everyone see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, typically, so this is radiation with average of H, uh, horizontal and vertical, but it's right here. Um, 2.9, there's a, usually a lobe. Um, it, and if well, you- you're actually around, it's, you seem to 1. be- 1.9. Yeah, 1.9, excuse me. 1.9, there's the lower lobe of the bridge hill in radiation. And on 2.2, there's an upper um, load. And then there's typically one at 3.5. And then there's this dip here. Um, and that will be typically th three kilohertz, a little below. So um, if you tip, if this were an average of 100 violins, you'd see a slight minima there, which is why I put the the band. Um, let me see if it's, yes. Yeah, so 2940 is where that um, dip appears. When, if you look at, you know, 100 violins. Yeah, and Joseph, if I remember, the same dip occurred at a lower frequency with all of those um, Oberlin violas that was made several years ago in the, the, the OB Alto project. Yes, exactly. And this dip here at, um, at 2350 is remarkably frequently stable over any, like almost any group of even five instruments, you'll see this, there's a tendency to a dip there. So I think it's, there are these things that are going on. I don't know what they're related to physically. And if, um, but but I'd, I'd love to be able to test any theory about what causes each one. I mean, why is this one here um, if, if it's a group average? Um, well, I, I think I I think those, some of those dips there are, are I, I would interpret it as um, uh, resonances of the island area. They, they, they could well be. I certainly see that in, in my internal sound measurements. There's a number of dips. So I've concentrated one on one, which is very pronounced and the same on all instruments. Ah, okay, so here I found my, um, this was 122 violins, including about, I don't know, 40 old Italians. Um, which isn't showing, okay. I think there's some path error with this late, latest version. Um, Ah, okay. This is um, just because I happen to have it. Tim Dwernick, if I'm pronouncing his name right, mm -hmm. made um, came to Oberlin. He'd made a bunch of um, carbon fiber instruments, um, and um, so this is a. Um, let me see. Uh, horizontal HV average. Um, mm -hmm. We see um, 434, 509, very low B1 plus, very high amplitude B1 minus at about a normal frequency. Um, and again, we have the lower lobe of the bridge hill right around 19. In this case, the upper lobe is, um, is larger. That varies from instrument to instrument. And then again, we have this divide 2350. It's just uncanny, 2340. Um, and then this would be the dip, perhaps that Colin's talking about. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I, I'm not well organized. I, I don't have my, um, yeah, I don't I, have I think the files the, at hand, but yeah, hopefully I, I made the point. Yeah, I think the dip point. is most pronounced, not even in averages, but in the overlays, because when you see the overlays, then you can see that, oh, the overwhelming majority of instruments have a dip there. Yes. And, I'd actually so, be curious to work with a statistician in in terms of 
what's the likelihood of finding a minima at a certain frequency and track that over a bunch of instruments? Because in any one instrument, there might there could even be a slight you know peak here. You know, it's uh, but yeah. we what we're trying to do is explain. I'm assuming that anything that shows a feature over a broad range of instruments is related to something in the vibrating structure or in the air modes of you know inside or um or of course mm -hmm. the worry is it could be the you know the measurement system but I, I think i've pretty much ruled that out because different systems even minel going back to his measurements have um, very similar things here yeah but, the thing that causes dips mm -hmm. is uh, is when a nodal line passes through your measurement point so what you're looking at is something where if you were to just uh, animate the mode shapes of the internal air or what, whatever it is that has been measured as a function of frequency, it's when most violins have a nodal line which passes through your measurement point around about that frequency. So that will be the, the physical interpretation of these things. Whether that's deeply important, if you choose a different measurement point, the nodal line will not be passing through it at that frequency. So it, the prediction is that it's very specific to particular measurements. Right. So with this radiation, yeah. these are average 12 around. So it's, it's yeah, well, 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 yeah, aver averaging makes it difficult to interpret anything. That That's true. Collins is a point measurement, so it's it's much more clear. So it, it may be somewhere where there tends to be a transmission transition from a symmetric to anti-symmetric air mode. And so that there's a nodal line that comes right, in. But the over. curious thing is that if if the same dip is occurring in the internal cavity measurements and, and Joseph's external acoustic well, radiation. If, if it is the same thing, it, it's if, not yes. so clear. Yes, it's yeah, not yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, this may not be important, but it is certainly very curious. <laughs> um, Joseph, uh, just something's bothering me a little bit. You, you said that you could uh, tell from the admittance measurement what the frequency of the bridge rock is. I said um, that? Yes, you did. Oh. Um, uh, well, I, not very long I, ago. But, if uh, I, if I did, I misspoke. Um, what I meant is the admittance that the Bridge Hill, um, as as I think um, Jim would define it, or or right. So so you identify the region as a Bridge Hill from the admittance, but you don't identify where that rock frequency is. But that's a relief because in you know you've you've seen my three um, D animations of uh, bridges in situ, haven't you? I do hope you have because there were a lot of work. Uh, <laughs> What what actually happens is, although that bridge rocking frequency, the bridge bounce frequency, and a number of others are clear when you work on a, you know one of these oversized bridges or something where you can clamp the feet, and you can observe those as discrete modes. When you put them on the on top of that island with all its mobility under its feet, you may never actually see uh, anything close to a clear example of a bridge rocking frequency. You see it sort of shared out in little bits over a free modes over a wide range. And, um, and I think it's complicating the situation because we're looking at a, a mode by mode situation. And it doesn't seem to be that logical that that should always occur. So uh, specifically at that 2.9 frequency, because the other modes in from one violin to another, they can move around by, you know, quite a few, quite a few tens of hertz. Well, let me just that, that's it um the um the bridge um according to jim if i'm not dis misinterpreting the actual rocking frequency of the bridge on the instrument can be determined by looking at the real and imaginary parts um so um even though it's it's the damping's too great etc to see any peaks we can see a point where the the phase is flipping or in the middle of the phase flip jim could you just yeah, that, that, that's but but it's not the rocking frequency as people talk about it for what you'd measure with the feet clamped. Oh, definitely so it, not. It's, it's quite a separate thing. Whereas Collins dip just might be because of this Carleen Hutchins anti resonance argument. Hmm. So it, it is possible. I have to think about this, but it is possible that an internal air measurement actually reveals an anti resonance at the at the clamped feet. I mean, things like that happen in other problems, 
whether it happens in this one needs some clear thought and in the middle of a meeting like this isn't the time to do clear <laughs> thought but it is but it is possible it makes some sense that it could be to do with the air modes because violins don't vary that much in internal dimensions and probably the wall cavity stiffness differences are not so great that they shift the modes around Whereas there's anything... an awful lot of air modes once you get up to three kilohertz though yeah. the, the, the modal density of air modes is rises rapidly and so mm -hmm. somewhere about there is when the modal density of internal air modes overtakes the modal density of plate modes and can we say that not all the internal air modes radiate outside the instrument absolutely uh, no, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so when we're doing an internal measurement, we have to realize that it's not necessarily related at high frequencies. To... No, absolutely. Now, once you get above right, right. 800 hertz, the monopole argument um, disappears. I mean, Colin is right that it's a, it's a repeatable measurement and it's quiet and clean and it tells you some things and it's fine down in the signature mode reason, region, but it's hard to know what significance it would have at three, four kilohertz. Well, well, the interesting thing, Jim, is that um, uh, I, I, I would uh, have agreed with you had I not done, done the measurements on the um, the string modes, because I mean it, it's clear to me that uh, that uh, right up to four kilohertz or so, I'm I'm seeing all the string modes um, uh, um, in in my measurements. Um, uh, and it's it's affect it's affecting the the sound inside the instrument, and therefore, um, it, it, if I can see a string resonance on the system, I ought to be able to see any other resonance on the system. But that doesn't con that doesn't contradict what um, Jim is saying. No, I, I mean it's an interesting observation, but it's a different point. It, um, uh, it's almost certainly an artifact of the Bridge Hill of the roll off once you're above the bridge hill that the strings are progressively decoupled from the plates and it's exactly. the plates that are making your internal sound. So Absolutely. once you're on that fall on that drop off in the in the bridge admittance, then the strings are not driving the body very well because that's what the fall in admittance is showing you. That's and so exactly you, you lose that. sight of the string resonances in the internal sound. That's perfectly sensible. Yeah, that's what that's what I was emphasizing. Yeah. Well, 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 you 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 lose track of the rot um, the rotational amends, but the vertical starts coming into its own right there. Yes, it is possible, <clears throat> and and you must always remember too that um, uh, the, the, as the Helmholtz goes up and down the strings, and this is personally true of the the um, resonating strings, um, uh, they excite. A, a pulse to the instrument via the neck, and it's not simply if you tap it. If you tap um, when you bow the instrument itself, um, the the Helmholtz kink going up and down the string excites the bridge, but it also excites the the nut of the bridge. You can tell that because you've only got to tap the nut of the bridge, and you can hear the sound coming out. So both yeah. have to be involved. That's certainly true. It's less true if you do your tapping with a player holding the neck. Well, I I, I don't know. It's, it's about not the nut. That. No, uh, that, 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 is, that is true. You you, you add damping. Well, if you, if you hold them, if you hold the neck, but if you hold the string with your finger, um, the amount of energy um, that you absorb as you go through a resonance it, it, it is independent of damping. Uh, I I think I'm right in saying. And um, uh, and so that that energy uh, will be going into the the instrument itself, even if you've got a damp uh, a soft finger. But you're adding damping to the the neck modes, and you're affecting. Yes. I mean, yeah, this I is the matter of the input admittance under the under the stopping point at the at the oh. finger end of the string. I'm I'm only pointing out that the tapping on the nut which implies that there is no player's hand in there, will give a different answer. You don't hear so much noise if you tap, if you go up to a player while they're holding the instrument as usual and then tap next to their mm -hmm. finger. But you do hear a different, uh, uh, changing the subject slightly, 
you do a different uh, 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 difference in sound of the instrument when you tap it when you've got damp strings and undamped strings. Of course, oh yes, I mean, yeah. that's the, mm -hmm. that's why it's impossible to use George Bissinger's data for any anything very much because he always did his measurements with undamped strings and they dominate the effect. So the stuff you most want about the body is down in the noise. But, but, but uh, they, they don't, in fact. I mean, I, I've got... They're doing his measurements. Trust me, I've tried this. Uh, well, <laughs> they, 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 don't, they don't in my measurements. They, 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 they are just simply... <clears throat> Superimposed on, on on the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as anti resonances, as you say, because they absorb energy. No, 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 they're they're wolf eliminate. They're, they're always dips rather than peaks because they the well, the only, uh, only string. Uh, no, no, they're not always. They're not just dips. They're they're they're, they're proper <clears throat> because because you've got um um. I think you'll find the string resonance frequency is always a dip. There may be a peak next to it. Just yes, there will be. Often. It, it, yeah. Because, you, because if, if you put a string resonance, which is a sharp resonance, on, 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 on a, a capacitor, a, 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 a reactive element, you, you, get, you get a mixture of the two. <clears throat> so you get a peak and uh, at low frequencies, you get a peak <clears throat> and a dip. Um, and but at high frequencies, the interesting thing is, um, <clears throat> there's a, 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 a one at low frequencies. I was just going to try and find. Um, <clears throat> uh, you, the dip will be larger than the the, the peak, as it were. But uh, but high frequencies, interesting, and it, it you lose the dispersive element which you would expect from the phase with something going through ninety degrees. Uh, <clears throat> 180 degrees going through resonance, um, um, uh, uh, which which suggests to me that the rate that, that the uh, only way that you could account for that is the high frequency resonances of the violin being largely resistive and, and having a small, but they're not. In fact, if you look at it, that um, that you see as much reactive as resistive. Um, they are resistive at all frequencies. Instead of yeah. getting separate peaks in the real part, the, the real part is non-zero everywhere. Because yeah. once you get into modal overlap, there Absolutely. is a participation at all frequencies. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's probably well, that's, most of these people don't want to hear this discussion. Yeah, so, <laughs> quite, yeah. so can I ask um, I, a base I, bar? I want to I want to ask a, a base bar question, which um, yep. um, makers ask all the time about the experiment. Um, but so, I will preface I'm, it first. I'm just ask a quick question before you do that, yeah. because otherwise it'll Go be ahead, not. Uh, I just have a little bit of clarification. When I excite the string resonance resonances by tapping the bridge, presumably the harmonics, the level that the harmonics get excited to will be related to the modes that are near to those resonances, won't it? So no, it, no. Um, no, you think they're all well the, as they, they will were, show up in your all, in, all the, if you start with a rigid string, mm -hmm. um, uh, all, all the modes will actually have a force acting on it, um, uh, uh, and the, the ex uh, cause an, uh, 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 cause the bridge to move. Yeah, so is it like simply initiating a Helmholtz kink in the string? Yes. Yeah. Case the, the, a, the, the harmonics the, roll off with frequency anyway, so by the time you get up to uh, four or six kilohertz, there's there's not very much energy in those harmonics. No, uh, uh, and that, uh, actually, if you look at the, if if those uh, measurements that I showed you of the string resonance is going right the way up to to um what was it three kilohertz at least and possibly a little larger. Um, but, but being damped at, at higher frequencies, since since what you're attaching, if the energy element is 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 valid, you know what the um, um, impedance basically is of the strings are. So you know how much um, for a given um, uh, bridge admittance, how ma uh, how much energy is actually going in, to go in the string. Now Jim Jim can do that, does does that sort of thing. So. Um, but it, you're, you're, uh, but basically, you're putting a known amount of uh, an, an, another 
what you, you what, what the strings are doing almost is putting a probe on your measurements uh, uh um so if you see the resonance you know how much energy is going off into there and that relates therefore if it's a change in energy it can tell you how much energy was there to start with without it that sounds a bit con convoluted but what uh, this ought to remind you of is is gabby weinreich's ingenious inverse measurement where he drove with a sound wave and measured on the bridge or on the string so he used the reciprocal measurement yeah. method uh, to use this. But I think this, this is a rather physics-y discussion, which we yeah. should probably have yeah. in a different... What, but why, why, oh, Weinreich, Weinreich actually gave another, another demonstration to me when I went to him the first time I met him in his laboratory, in which he had um, um, a, um, a noise source, broadband noise source, and he just took out one component of the frequency. And what you hear is a steady sound at that component that's been taken out. Now, that's not surprising, in fact, if you take it out of an, uh, a repetitive wave uh, a waveform. Um, if you take one particular frequency out, um, it's uh, um, that should have been there. You've that's got a the noise that was there to start with minus the signal that comes from the, the single you, the single frequency you, you, you hear no, it. I think you don't hear it you hear it most clearly if you change that frequency you hear it moving it, hmm. it's not so easy to pick it out if it's just static but, 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 you, but you, you, no, you track the but, change but, that that's but, a well-known phenomenon but, but, yeah uh, yeah it's, it's brilliant but it, it it does does suggest in fact that that, that you know, um even sympathetic strings um, uh, um, uh, can affect the the the, the, the pitch of notes, and yeah. it's um, well, it never mind. Right, right. So, it, so, it, 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 in the can, same can we way, go back it, to the bass bar. Yeah, let, let's go back to bass yeah, bars. So, yeah. so, so I'm going to um, start this question with with uh, a preliminary question in your computer simulations when you change the quote unquote strength of the base bar, what are you actually changing? Are you changing the material properties or the size no, of the no, base bar? No, in fact, I didn't change its mass. I changed, I think I changed its um no, I think I changed its mass. Because because I turned the thing on from scratch. Um and I can only do that with a fixed geometry by 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 either changing its mass or or, or uh, its compliance. Well surely okay. it was compliance. Yes. Right, but okay. So, but the the, the real so so um, the question that violin makers um, um, ask all the time, especially with the bass bar experiment, you know, as we, for example, change the height of the bass bar, is they want to know: Are we really changing the mass or the stiffness? Yeah, which is the more important component? I I think I think I think I I'd have to go back. It's it's a long ago now. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember the the complete details, but I mean it was the difference of turning it on from not having no effect at all to having it, it uh, uh, as a mass of two point eight or whatever it was. Um, so I must have changed, been changing the mass. Well, we know that if if you put that rectangular bar on a violin and you started lowering the height, the mass would be going down. Um, yeah. proportionally and but the stiffness would be going down to what the the cube yeah. so we're mainly affecting the stiffness but yeah all right yeah I'd have to go back I'm sorry to, to my original so I, I so I think that it's the, quite the... A result couldn't it if you're changing mm -hmm. changing the actual stiffness or compliance uh, I I I I I, I, I think I was doing my trick of keeping the um, the frequency the same. In fact, I have to do that to to, to so that the frequency is unchanged. The, the, the rocking frequency um, uh, it, it, uh, the, of the bridge um, um, it is is unchanged. So I was checking. I mean, it was, um, 
and you can do that by by of course changing the mass and the compliance just um together Sim um i did that in, in a number of my early computations doesn't so i mean kept one uh, frequency the same but changed its effect so i could turn it right the way off and turn it right way on but keeping its frequency constant. But really understand what you're doing there. Are, are you reducing the the stiffness as you increase the mass? No, no, no. You 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 change the mass and the the the, the stiffness. Uh, then how, how can it? So, so, since the frequency is equal to the square root of the, uh, of, of, of the stiffness over the mass, you can keep the same frequency by changing either uh, by by changing them both by the same amount. And you can change it right the way down to naught. So it won't be there, or one when it's there, or a hundred times larger when it's a hundred times larger. The effect of the, the bridge, but keeping the frequency the same. Yeah. So, Colin, what one of your your um, the Bridge Island um, paper that was um, um, given at Montreal? I think the paper said that you scaled both the mass and the stiffness together. I think. Yeah, together. You've got a good, but you've got a much better memory than. No, no, I don't have a good memory. I, I have the paper, you know. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, all right. That's what I did. Yeah, exactly. Okay. To keep the same frequency. Right. Be, because the, you know, the, the, um, the, the question that the violin makers, you know, ask, you know, the, the hypothetical question is, well, you know, which is more important because maybe I should, you know, keep, um, use a different piece of wood or, or change the geometry so that, you know, to keep the same mass, but make it stiffer or et cetera, et cetera, so, you know, and not well, just... Well, you have to change, change them the both together if you want to keep the same rocking frequency. Uh, and I mean, since since we've come to the conclusion that it should... But no, be, well, we're talking about the base bar. We're talking about the That's base what bar. everyone does. Sorry. We're talking about the base bar, so... Sorry. Are we... Yeah, but it's the same. It's the same. It's the same. I understand. Base the same. Bar. Yeah, concept. the same with the same base, mm -hmm. base bar and the same with with the rocking frequency. Yeah, I think um, it would be interesting. And uh, Fan, we've discussed this is maybe having a panel of of makers. I see even yeah. now there's a bunch of good makers around here um, talking about their practice um, mm -hmm. and and just get a sense of. How how well does common practice tie in with what we're seeing in the measurements? Do do people think that's a good idea? Would that be worth doing? Because I think how it works out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Joseph. So so like a, very a much lot of so, this, Joseph. Um, except very, that, very much so. Thank you. Whoever said that? I don't George, know. you. Oh, good. Okay. Okay. Thank you, George. Um, yeah, because my my sense with a lot of these things, which um, um, are the accepted um, standard practices, is that um, our experiments show that they they you know they produce the best results on average for the you know in 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 the overwhelming majority of the cases, but they don't necessarily produce the best result for a particular instrument, and and so when makers are confronted with particular instruments that are outliers. Um, our problems, then they want to know what can they do to them. And, and so I think um, while it's um, reassuring that the, um, the standard base bar height on average gives the highest output, and, um, but makers want to know, well, if I have a particular problematic instrument, is there anything I can do, for example, with the base mm -hmm. bar to solve the problem? And then we need to know you know, that, that's the whole point of this, really the whole point of this experiment is, well, what can we do with the base bar to actually affect the results of a particular instrument? I would say that um, we, we, we talk about the um, version two of the height as being normal, um, I think 11.9. I, th I think of that as on the high range of normal. I think if you looked at specs, people would say nine to 12. And so this is right at the tip. So it was a bit of a surprise to me that with four, you know, really quite different instruments, it it, it did the same thing. Um, so um, I'm curious to know from, you know, again, a panel of makers, how often would you put a 12 millimeter bass bar on a violin? Um, I don't know. I'm going to do, I'm going to do it more often. All right. now so that I, see so that. I so do that. 12 and higher. 
Mm -hmm. Um, So when I heard 11.8, I thought that's a little on the lower side for what I would do. For me, for me. Mm -hmm. And Um, and your your higher base bar comes from what? From from personal experience or from somebody? Personal experience. Okay. If well, I can't make a base bar twelve millimeters high. I want it to be reasonably low density wood, you know, like 0.36 or something like that. My base and bars I'm might weigh like three grams sometimes. Yes, that's quite light. So, but you can all, also uh, make it more um, triangular or parabolic in. Yes. Process. So you, you're getting rid of some. You're getting rid of some mass, but you're so you're having more mass and uh, but still a lot of stiffness. Less mass, but plenty of stiffness. Exactly. Way, which some people would say is acoustically more efficient. I, I don't know. It's 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 different. I think if you want very very bright in your face violins, that's probably the way to go. George, that that's that's a remark that we've heard made before. And surely it's wrong. Um, but the, <laughs> if, if you want to trade, um, you maximize stiffness while minimizing mass, you'd use an I beam or a T beam. So you want it thicker at the top than at the bottom. You don't want it parabolic. That's yeah. going the opposite way. That is not. Sure. That is not. Um, oh, well, stiffness. it's it's true if you're using a, a solid wood. A zaret a zaret bar. Yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, if you if you wanted low mass but maximum stiffness, yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely, you'd do a zaret bar, or you you you'd carve a, a T beam. You'd have a sticking out bit at the top. <laughs> it isn't isn't at all a bar with a a, a you know a different pro, a cross section. It's your second moment of inertia. Well, I, I t- taller, taller will I- increase stiffness. No, but once you've got the bar shaping the cross section, a square cross section. And then shaving it down to a parabolic cross section, I think you'll lose probably more stiffness than mass. Interesting. Yeah. Um, but, but, but it doesn't sound that way. You were. Here, anyway. Well, no, the, I think the way to think about it, if you if you had a square one and you start shaving off the sides and sticking that on the top, then you would keep the same mass and you get stiffer and stiffer. That's, yeah. 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 We're meeting with makers and their practices. I mean, this is a good question, really, to see what people think about that. Because I, I talked to quite a few makers who have been experimenting with doing things like that to their bars. Mm-hmm. Seem to be saying similar things to what I'm saying, but uh... which is more in your face with a stiffer, lighter bar. So Christian has his hand well, up. Uh, well, Jim isn't sure that this is what's happening. <laughs> yeah, uh, so Christian. Maybe uh, I don't know, but anyway, you can make you can certainly make your bar lighter by changing the profile. Mm-hmm. You can draw we'll holes see what in Christian it. has to say. <laughs> yes, uh, j- just to say, I make my bass bar in the complete opposite way. Uh, it's kind of a T shape, but not a T because it will be more complicated. But the thinner part is glue on the top, and the larger part, it's. Uh, the other side, so it's it's exactly the opposite shape of what everybody is doing. You have the minimum contact with the top and maximum rigidity, like uh, like if it was a T. It's a triangle, mm-hmm. but uh, I don't know if it's clear, it's clear. It's not clear for you to understand, but and I have a lot of mass and rigidity with very little contact with the top. So it's like a T T beam, but how wide is your contact with the top? I mean, is there sufficient for? It's it's uh, at the center. It's three millimeter. So it's very narrow. And there's a bridge, so it's the opposite. Uh, the normal bass bar shape is like that, mm-hmm. large, where it's glued with, with the top and thinner. I do the opposite. So, because you you ask if somebody uh, try different uh, cross uh, shape, and I I do it for the last eight years, sixty instrument, and some of my colleagues in repair did it on the older instrument to say it's not scientific experiment because I didn't made I didn't make T 
10 bass bar for the same volume. But I start to have the, some experience because 60 instrument plus 100 in repair for my colleague. We start to have some view of, uh, because my theory is complicated. You think the bass bar is a spring, it's a mass and it's a support. So I decided to take one hypothesis. It's only a support. I, I thought only in static way, not about vibration, but just to, to have a static support. So I make it the strongest possible with the less direction with the, and uh, and it works it works better than my also bass bow. I learned very traditional. I was back to assistant, and uh, many instrument I change the bass bar, my own instrument because I don't do repair anymore. Where sounding better with this new system. It doesn't mean it works with every instrument, but at least the, the traditional way of making a bass bar, it's not the only way to make something working well. Uh, according to, to my clients and friends, uh, you play a well, good player. Uh, everything is better. Uh, projection, uh, speed of response, uh, harmonics. So just to say the traditional bass bar, it's fine, but uh, you can have and the sound of my instrument had really violent sounding. I'm not doing a completely different kind of sound. But uh, in my bass bar, I'm much heavier than your normal bass bar. Uh, it is much so heavier? Yeah, yeah. What, what is the typical mass? Uh, Eight, eight grams. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's really, but yeah. with very little contact with the top. So I'm sure it's not coupling as much as what you describe in, uh, in, in your work. It's, it's very heavy, but not completely coupled with the top because it's very thin. And I have uh, some bridges. I have only three or four point of contact with the top. Fascinating. So it's complete, but, but what is funny is the, the violin sounds still like a violin. It doesn't change completely the sound. It mm -hmm. just seems to be a bit more efficient for my instrument. Um, um, I think it was um, Oliver Rogers pointed out, in, I think in simulations of bass bar, that at a certain point, the, the bar will start doing that. And my sense is when you have something like a T bar that that's going to be happening. No, I don't think so because within because the, the within shape, the audible, audible range because of, of the shape, I have three millimeter in the center, but I have eight millimeter on the extremity. Exactly. So you have something like that, but I think there'd be a frequency. Yeah. There's always going to be a frequency at which it starts doing that. I'm I just don't suggesting. think so because it's so large at the extremities and 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 my bar. Bass bar is flat. I mean, I don't have this, this shape, it's, so it's very rigid. I don't see any vibration in this, this direction. Well, you can see it. It would it'd be better yeah, of course. Me measuring it, but that, that's that's fascinating. Um, well, it'd be fun if you ever come to Oberlin to, to, to measure um, an instrument and maybe try one with a normal one and, and, and fool around with that. Um, a very very precise uh, precise thing to measure thing. They are fantastic musician, and I think uh, musicians are more precise than any any uh, measurement. I think you struggle sometimes to see in your measurement what people can feel when they are playing. So, and well, uh, well that you, you you found the the measurement system that is most important for us is. As makers, it's it's less useful for an, an analysis, but I, I agree with you there. 
Um, and, and, yeah. Okay. Andrew. Hi there. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, the discussion of mass versus the stiffness, I think your explanation, Joe, is perfect of, you know, if you just take stuff from the width and add it to the top, I mean, that's the simplest sort of uh, um, a way to look at, uh, you know, keeping the cross section the same, vo the same area, but redistributing versus you know, are you accentuating stiffness or are you accentuating mass? So if you're accentuating stiffness, you're adding to the height, but reducing the width. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be parabolic shape, you know, if it's just that sort of rectangular shape. Um, and if you make it low and wide, you're accentuating the mass rather than the stiffness. Um, the, other, the other factor, speaking about Christian's base bar um, and this idea of a T, shape um, in other modes uh, that T shape will have you know we have torsional modes in the plate it's not just bending straight up and down so we know that an I beam will be much more torsionally stiff than just a rectangular shape so higher modes may be affected detrimentally because we do have important torsional modes. Um, uh, I think that's, <laughs> that's all I wanted to contribute, perhaps, mm -hmm. unless you had a specific yeah. question. Yeah. I, I think I sort of see in Christian's bar is like there's a big effect of mass and sort of anecdotal um, justifications are hard to, to pin down because, for instance, Christian may have very, very stiff plates. And yes, this, this works well for him because it adds a lot of mass and reduces the the resonance of the plate meaning it puts it into a more normal area of resonance if it, if that makes sense uh, it's funny to, to when i changed the bus bar even when i was restoring my experience i don't know if you confirm andrew it affects more the higher strings and the lower lower strings so it's a bit confirmed that what uh, what we have seen today, or, or even the last uh, uh, bus bar uh, meeting, but it seems that when I change the bus bar, it affects more the higher strings than the lower. Is it your experience and grew or? Um, sure, you, I mean, you can get all sorts of effects, but I think, I think my point would be um, there needs to be much more uh, experimentation with um, this idea of distribution of mass and stiffness, um, and maybe even different materials, because you can pick materials that have I, I very tried high. To, I, I tried to get the carbon fiber bus bar. No, I'm thinking just like so. So George Hugh said his base bar is weigh three three grams, and and George Stepani seemed to say the same. So that's you know, if you're going to use very low density materials, then you would think, yeah, you need to make it very narrow and very tall um, because that it is sort of um, in, in agreement with the materials. Whereas if you had very stiff materials, you'd want to sort of leave it low and wide because the material is quite stiff. So you'd leave it lower to uh, not accentuate its stiffness and you'd make it wide because you want to drive the modal behavior, the frequency of the mode down. So this idea of like expanding the the range of resonance and the range of mass and stiffness distribution, I think is important in the conception of the base bar. But there are materials that you can pick that have very high density and very low speeds of sound. So they would have very particular modulus, just as you might pick a material that has a very low density and a very high speed of sound that has a particular modulus. Yeah, uh, so I mean, in terms these, of you know, if we, if we were to do future base bar experiments, I mean, it seems to me one of the logical things to do is, number one, um, to do the computer simulations and just, for example, varying just the mass or the, or the stiffness, see what the computer simulations predict, and then devise an experiment to, um, you know, copy, to, to, to emulate the, the, um, the simulations to see 
the, the actual experimental results track. Right. The simulation. I mean, my, my own my own experimentation with just with beams, just looking at a beam. If you if you keep the cross section area the same, but make a very low wide beam out of very heavy mm -hmm. soft material and a very tall narrow beam out of very stiff light material, they will have the same deflection. Well, yeah, so, so a very, very no. different resonant profile. So this is a kind of the experimentation that I'm talking about that how to exploit the material in form and its modules. Yeah. But there's, um, I guess the point I would make is that um, I think we're searching for some of the more fundamental um, variables and how they affect the results. And the selection of the materials is actually then um, sort of the implementation part of it. And so the 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 challenge with all of these experiments is that there, there's so many variables that it's very, in practice, it's very difficult to do these exp experiments to, to have all these variables. So, yep. and Joseph and I have talked about this, you know, because he feels, and I agree with him, that really the long-term future of experiments like this um, is computer modeling and computer yeah. simulations. However, you have to validate your computer models, you know, so that you can um, have some confidence in the results you're generating. So, so typically, you know, you devise a, a series of experiments to validate your computer models, and if they match your computer models quite, you know, accurately, then you have more confidence that by varying other things in your computer models that the predictions will you know, can accurately predict the, the actual results. But to do the actual experiments of all these variations, I mean, is somewhat impractical. So you have to pick, you know, the experiments you do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I agree that that uh, finite element analysis could uh, point or, or, or narrow the, the, the breadth of such experiments to something practical. You know, if you ran the experiment just, mm -hmm. just computationally you could sort out a lot of stuff ahead of time and make the experiment much more narrow and effective for sure um yeah i agree 100 percent. unfortunately i have completely computer illiterate <laughs> so I, I leave that to the smart people <laughs> i just scrape on wood <laughs> christian yeah, uh, just we have seen in the presentation, if I understood well, some valin without bass bar as a huge Wolf note, day one plus very, very strong. So we can guess and we can use a bass bar to control the Wolf notes problem. Is it your experience, makers? or? Sorry, was that? Is it clear what I'm trying to say here? Yeah, uh, we we have seen that the, the valin without bass bar at the huge Wolf note, I think, because we, we have seen the day one plus really very high. So are you used to, to use the bass bar to control this, this uh, Wolf note? I, I don't, I think that would be a... a no, it'd be too okay. too hard, and it's not a direct. Um, what and, Andrew, do you do you use a bass bar to control Wolf notes problem? I think you can. I think you know if you, the traditional approach would be to add stiffness or add mass. You you have to. Yeah, for, 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 for me, I, I had a lot of problem with Wolf note on my own instrument. I and recently I understood that if I put my bass bar with more. Uh, Inclination, uh, mm -hmm. crossing more the grain, uh, reduces uh, this wolf note issue on, on valin at least, not on the cello valin. Uh, but does anybody have this kind of experience? Or? Well, I, I, I don't think have, with crossing grains, I, I think that's a not a productive endeavor personally, but. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the, the trick there would be to use George Stepani's thing. You do an admittance measurement and see where the base bar is going to be and then try and do something to lower that peak or split that peak. And 
the bass bar would, you could change the frequency of it somewhat, it, but I think it's not a very efficient way of doing it. But I, are yeah, you but saying- it, it, uh, Often it's the only, like if you're dealing with old instruments, often it's the only solution, may not be the most efficient, but it's a, it's a kind of grayscale you know, is it more advantageous to reduce it or more advantageous to keep it or reduce it a little bit? Or, you know, it's it's not ideal, but it may in a practical situation be the only thing that you can do. Um, but don't you think that what you're doing is shifting its frequency, hopefully have it between notes so it's not... Exactly. You're just yeah. you're either trying to reduce its amplitude through additional mass or change its frequency to put it in a less problematic location or uh, increase the stiffness so the amplitude goes down. Those are all like just very sort of basic solutions that are, yeah, uh, may not be maximal for uh, you know, the ideal sound, but there are practical ways to fix something that is keeps you from selling the violin. <laughs> but but rather than rather than taking the top off and putting a bar on, if I wanted to change the frequency, if you put maybe a, um, a third of a gram on the upper wing of the base F hole, it will do the same thing. Um, it's just a lot easier. That's why I mean it's not a very direct or easy way to do it by changing the base bar. If you have to, if you have to change the base bar anyway, that's a different yeah. question. Yeah, exactly. I agree. You certainly can <laughs> change and yeah. shift around the mode frequencies uh, as uh, Roberto and Unai's experiment showed, but actually you have to change the base bar height quite a lot to get a sort of 10 degree, 10 hertz shift. Whereas I think often wolf notes are can be associated with substructure resonances like tailpieces and neck fingerboard which often have much higher q values than the um, particularly the the volume change modes because of air coming in and out of the f-holes they tend to be higher damped but uh but it's actually easier often to move the mode of the substructure than it is to change the base bar the base bar may otherwise have been all right it, you know, it wasn't problematic in terms of its stiffness and the effect that it's having on balancing the rotational components, et cetera. But, uh, but changing, um, you know, moving tail pieces around and fingerboards and necks is a lot easier. What? You... I agree. Agree, yeah. Yeah. But by doing simple, so, sorry, by doing simple measurements, um, you can easily find out um, in the signature mode region, exactly what happens, and um, if there is if there is a tailpiece resonance, or a fingerboard resonance, or something that's affecting your measurements, you can see it. Um, yeah, it's going to be problematic. Oops, well, with full modal analysis, we can see all of these things in excruciating detail far more detail than we know what but, to do with. But in 10 seconds, and you can you can see what the problem is. Well, you can you can find out the B1 frequency just by tapping the instrument in front of a yeah. microphone. You don't need to do anything more than that if you, you just want the frequency. It's, it, it's not the frequency that's important, it's the height. Uh, uh, it's the frequency and the height, but it's particularly uh, uh, having an over, over strong uh, either body resonance or tailpiece, or even a sympathetic string um, resonance um, that, that can ca ca cause major problems. I have to remember the admittance only tells you about how compliant that point is at that particular direction. It doesn't tell you what the system does with the energy. So energy that goes in, as we all know, goes into moving the strings, the air, the surface, the substructures, everything. So you don't know, you don't know where it goes. But the one of the points about things like um, you know minimum of bow force is, is simply the, the height of that peak and the admittance, and taken in combination with the first few harmonics, uh, and, and that's uh, th that seems to be quite a good indication indicator of a Boeing problem 
Now, whether or not a minimum bow force where it gets up an octave or whatever, whether that's exactly the same thing as a full-blown, full-blown warbling wolf, I'm not absolutely sure, but they're they're definitely related in some way. Yeah. Agreed. Well, we're um we're almost at four o'clock. I think I I, I sense that people are getting tired here. <laughs> so yeah. so um thank you joseph and uh thank you colin and thank you george and all, all of the um participants who um contributed to the discussion so um